Welcome everyone. Um, we will now going call to order the budget session for Thursday, September 15th, 2022. This is budget session number five, and it is our final work session on the budgets. I wanna remind everyone that this is not the final approval of the 2023 Monroe County Annual Budget, nor is it a formal budget hearing. The public hearing is scheduled for Tuesday, October 4th at 5.30 p.m. And the budget final adoption will occur on Tuesday, October 18th at 5.30 p.m. as well. The public can make comment, public comment regarding a budget during those meetings, and we welcome that. Departments will be invited here to join us tonight in the Nat U Hill room or virtually on Zoom. Departments have been allotted an amount of time on our agenda for their budget review based on last year's presentation time. As always, the council can extend that time as needed, but we need to be mindful in order to keep our discussion on budget reviews. Within your allotted time, a time please explain any increases, decreases, or additions to the budget. Council will then have the opportunity to make any um, recommendations to increase, decrease account lines based on any discussion and questions um, after the presentation on the, by the department head. Um, we'll take a voice vote to approve the uh, budget request. And again, it's not the final approval. It's just a recognition of the request as presented or amended by council. So now I will move to um, just the overview check-in. Do we have any updates to the numbers or any um, things that, that we wanna make sure everyone's aware of from last session before we get started? No? Um, I just want, Want to bring to council's attention that um, with the adjustments that were done last night, it was all done with regards to uh, the general fund. So there was some decreases um, in uh, the auditor and the other one, sorry, but we did increase the general fund because of the council's uh, request for the uh, BEDC. So that's the only thing that we did for the general fund. And then we also removed the amount from the economic development right. lift. So, which does not affect the 4B, draft 4Bs. So that was the uh, extent of the changes last night was general fund and the economic lift. Okay. Um, are there any questions, comments from others on council? Okay, go ahead, Councilor Munson. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for the Excel file for tonight's budgets. There's an email. I sent you an email with a, a, a link for that. Was that today? Yes. Oh. Yes, I did. I sent it today and I even That's... sent you a text saying I sent it. So. <laughs> and she called and sent a fax too. Well, so. I haven't been on email since early morning. Yeah. Okay. No, it was around, I want to say it was around the. It's okay. Three I'll, three find, so. I'll find it. Yeah, it, she sent the link to, to the file in Dropbox. Yeah, it's to the file in Dropbox, which, and I also sent the link. It also included the draft 4B mm -hmm. link as well. Which if you just download from Dropbox, it goes yeah. into Excel. Okay, are there any other questions or comments before we move on? Okay, so we are going to um, formally open the binding review of the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District and Monroe Fire Protection District budgets. At this time, I would like to invite the Solid Waste Management representatives to join us. Um, Councilor Decker, could you please give us a motion? Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 8210 Solid Waste Management Special Operating, category requests of $1,506,381 in the personnel category. $194,350 in the supplies category, <clears throat> $1,254,400 in the services category, 
$11,500 in the capital category for a total of $2,966,631. Second. Welcome. It's good to see you, Mr. McGlasson. Thank you. Um, I get, uh, first, I'd like to start to uh, introduce everybody to Ms. Holly DeWar. Uh, she's our recently hired a controller, uh, finishing her third week with us. So, um, oh, welcome. She, <laughs> so, let's try not to run her off with uh, mean <laughs> questions tonight. So. <laughs> we'll try to be kind. Um, so, again, thank you for, uh, for having us for your consideration um, of our budget again this year. Um, do I want to start off by uh, acknowledging that uh, our board of directors at their August 11th meeting uh, did, uh, uh, by a vote of 6-0, uh, approve this budget. Uh, unfortunately, with the new hybrid uh, rules, Mayor Hamilton was uh, attending virtually and so uh, did not uh, vote on the budget, uh, uh, given the, the new the rules in place with uh, votes on uh, budgets and financial matters with uh, electronic participation. So. Um, but we do have, uh, uh, he did express uh, support uh, for the budget uh, before the vote. So we feel we have unanimous support from our board uh, for this budget. Um, uh, as I did last year, I think I will just uh, go through, highlight some of the, the major differences uh, from the proposed budget for 2023 to the current budget. Uh, and then of course, uh, an answer any questions that the council may have. Um, I will start um, in the personnel services category. Um, this budget does have an 8.5% cost of living increase uh, for all employees. Uh, that is based on the um, Midwest Consumer Price Index for all urban wage earners and clerical workers. Uh, that is the same index that the district has historically used uh, to calculate cost of living increases uh, for its employees. Um, Additionally, there are uh, two new positions uh, budgeted for in this budget, um, a waste reduction specialist uh, that, uh, that we're still, uh, the staff and the board are, are still uh, working out the details of, of defining uh, the specifics of this position, but uh, the intent of it is to have a, a, somebody that will focus on uh, the solid waste management plan that the district adopted uh, last year. Uh, and uh, the goals and objectives that are in that plan and work with uh, uh, the community, predominantly uh, businesses and other major waste generators in the community uh, and, and start to try to implement some of the waste reduction efforts and the goals and objectives that are outlined in that plan. Um, the second position um, is a more of a laborer position to provide support and assistance uh, to our landfill compliance and household hazardous waste departments. Um, uh, the budget does uh, eliminate our assistant operations director position. Uh, not, not, not sure how many of you are aware, but uh, our longtime operations director, uh, Scott Morgan, uh, did, uh, for medical reasons, uh, retire this year. Um, and uh, our, uh, our Joy, Joy Long, who has been our assistant operations director for a number of years um, acted in the capacity of operations director during uh, Mr. Morgan's absences uh, over the past uh, six to nine months. And uh, uh, in, in doing so, he and I, uh, uh, when Mr. Morgan announced his retirement, uh, did discuss the situations and opportunities uh, uh, and challenges that that might present. But we were both very comfortable uh, that we could uh, you know, do some reorganization uh, and uh, be able to eliminate that assistant operations director position uh, without uh, having any negative impact on uh, the programs and services that we provide to the community. Uh, <clears throat> we also did uh, get a 6.2% uh, premium increase on our health insurance, uh, which uh, uh, it, still a substantial increase, but uh, that is about half of, of the increase we've had uh, each year over the past two to three years. So uh, we, are, we are pleased with that. Um, and additionally, uh, make you aware, um, uh, for this coming plan year, um, for the first time, the district has been able to offer two plan options to our employees. 
uh, the uh, preferred provider plan or PPO that we have uh, had in place for a number of years, uh, as well as a health savings account plan. So, um, and we wound up with about an even split on that. Uh, we had uh, uh, nine employees elected to stay with the PPO plan uh, and eight employees uh, enrolled in the, uh, uh, the new uh, health savings account plan. Uh, so that's uh, 17 out of 23 eligible employees that are taking advantage of the district's health insurance offering. Uh, and then just uh, the total category increase on personnel service is $115,496, uh, which is an 8.3% increase uh, over last year. Um, so um, on the supplies category, um, a $4,400 increase in, uh, in fuel. Um, I'm sure we're all aware where fuel costs currently are and what our year-to-date numbers, or imagine what our year-to-date numbers look like. So we uh, felt the need to do a substantial increase on that. Uh, our general operating supplies decreased by 17,000. Uh, we have appropriations in this year's budget uh, for new signage at all of our facilities. Uh, and that's related to uh, uh, some rebranding um, goals that are, that are in our five-year management plan. Um, uh, we had a $2,400 increase in our road-based materials uh, for some planned improvements uh, at some of our rural recycling center lots. Um, we do have a new appropriation for uniforms of $2,000 uh, in order to provide uh, work shirts for our recycling and household hazardous waste employees to uh, uh, you know, have some uniformity in the appearance of our staff, make them more identifiable to the public uh, when they're at our facilities. Um, and then we had a big one, uh, orange bags um, increased $35,000. Uh, and that, that's just a price increase from the vendor. We did put that out for bid uh, this past spring. Um, uh, unfortunately, our current vendor was the only uh, bid that was received and uh, that was the increase that, that, that they bid. So, um, but the, the, the total category increase is only $28,000, but that is a 16.8% increase. Uh, in the services category, um, another substantial increase uh, in our laboratory line, uh, $15,000. Um, our, our current lab um, was proposing some price increases on us. Uh, we did um, saw quotes from three different labs um, and uh, it was not our current lab, but a different lab did uh, provide the most complete quotes for us for all the various uh, water sampling events that we have to do. And uh, that, that was the best one for us to base a budget on. Uh, and our plan is to move forward with that other lab. Uh, consultant fees decreased by 7,500. Uh, and then that's due to the removal of appropriations uh, related <coughs> to the rebranding that I referenced earlier. When we talked about the new signage. Uh, we do anticipate having that completed this year. Uh, other professional services increased by 13,400. Uh, that is predominantly due to price increases uh, of the contractors that we utilize for my, uh, most of the maintenance work at the closed landfill. Um, and then we do have a medical services decreased uh, by a little over $11,000, uh, although that money is still there. That's actually due to uh, moving the appropriation for the uh, uh, the AED devices that we lease uh, into an equipment rental line. We'll touch on that here in a minute. Um, telephones uh, increased uh, $1,300, and that's uh, based on our uh, current year to date um, expenses in that line. Uh, we are um, we, we have two of our rural recycling centers that uh, do have uh, monthly phone bills that are out of line uh, with with our other facilities. So we are looking at options for those those centers. Uh, hopefully, won't need that full appropriation. Uh, printing decreased by seven thousand. Again, that's related to the rebranding being completed, um, as well as the uh, uh, the three thousand decrease in media advertising. We are expecting about a $4,000 increase uh, in our workers' compensation insurance, uh, but we do have a, a $41,500 decrease uh, in our liability, uh, and that is solely uh, 
due to the landfill pollution prevention policy. Uh, that's a three-year policy that's not due to renew until the end of 2024. Um, uh, natural gas and electric uh, both both go up um, again that's uh, due to the you know the recent rate increases and what our current year-to-date numbers look like in those lines um, a small increase in vehicle pair and maintenance of $2,500 and that's uh, some of the uh, mechanics that we use our labor prices are increasing uh, the same thing with machinery and equipment uh, repair and maintenance uh, seeing some increases from our vendors um, snow removal is, uh, is increased 2,500, uh, again, due to the vendor price increases. Uh, again, hopefully that's not something we need the full appropriation of, but that obviously is wholly weather dependent through the uh, winter months. Um, and then you see the machinery and equipment rental uh, increase due to moving the AED lease money uh, into that line. Um, we do also have a new appropriation uh, for banking fees. Um, we, uh, we switched banks uh, late last year um, to a bank that's now offering us interest uh, on all of our accounts. Uh, we have a total of five accounts uh, with the bank uh, and um, that, uh, that, that estimated $1,000 in fees uh, is more than offset uh, by the interest uh, that we'll be earning. Um, just uh, for a little perspective there, uh, so far for 2022, we've paid $280 in banking fees and we've earned a little over $7,200 in interest on those accounts. So uh, the leachate disposal increased by $25,000. Uh, again, that's uh, just based on an anticipation of need um, where we are this year, what we did last year and uh, uh, seeing how accurate the farmer's almanac is when predicting rainfall. Um, uh, our hauling contract decreased by $5,900. Um, that's uh, that based on our, our year-to-date numbers this year. Uh, that is a contracted amount, but it's based on the number of hauls. And we've made some changes to try to be a little more efficient and decrease our number of hauls. And that seems to be having a, a positive impact. Um, uh, the glass hauling increase, uh, $2,000, um, and that's uh, based on year-to-date. That's strictly a function of the volume of glass that people are bringing to us. Um, and that category total uh, increase uh, is $16,275, uh, which is only 1.3%. Um, and then the capital outlay, um, we have a $20,000 decrease uh, due to the no anticipation of purchasing a vehicle. We have funds appropriated this year to, to replace one of our, uh, our, our only outreach and education vehicle. Uh, don't plan on purchasing any vehicles uh, next year. So, uh, and then I did want to point out uh, in the spreadsheet that you have, and I, and I apologize, oversight on my part, I did not catch this um, before I sent all this to Michelle, uh, but we have two cells uh, whose formulas did not update when I put all the numbers in. And that would be the, uh, uh, I guess on the third page of the spread, spreadsheet, uh, the 8210 fund total line uh, shows an increase decrease of uh, 23 compared to 22 of $540,398. Um, and that is actually the difference between 21 and 22. Uh, the 22 to 23 difference is an increase of $140,071, uh, which is about 4.95%. Um, and then the, the second cell uh, that did not update uh, is uh, the last line on the last page, uh, the, the budget total for all three funds. Uh, again, it's the same thing that actually uh, unfortunately shows the 21 to 22 comparison and the 22 to 23 comparison uh, is an increase of $185,036. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments to my left? No. To my right. I will just comment that I've looked at this budget so many times before it became final that I'm very glad for the arrival of this day and for you all to see it. 
So thank you to Mr. McGlasson for pointing out those those updates too. Nothing further. All right. Well, in that case, all those in favor of accepting the Solid Waste Management Special Operating Fund budget request, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Uh, five A two. Council, I move to open for discussion and review Fund 8283 Solid Waste Management Debt Service category requests of, in the services category, $305,370 for a total of $305,370. Second. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, this budget, again, this is related to the uh, bond that was taken out uh, to close the landfill back in 2007. Uh, the expense amounts are based on the amortization table uh, of that bond repayment schedule. Um, and uh, I'll take, I guess I'll take this opportunity to give you all a quick heads up too that uh, this, this budget does include the $400 annual agency fee that our current year budget did not. And uh, you will hear from us again uh, on the 27th for an additional appropriation to uh, cover that expense that uh, uh, somehow slipped through the cracks when everything got entered into Gateway. How much was that fee? $400. Oh, okay. Are there any questions to my left? Comments? Remind me of how many more years are on that, uh, on that note. On the, on the bond? Yeah. Uh, bond pays off in 2037, I believe. Because I think it was a 30 year bond and it then coincides with our 30 year post closure monitoring period. Okay. So, no time soon, in other words. No, unfortunately, no time soon. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Are there questions or comments decade. to my right? No? All right. Um, all those in favor of accepting the Solid Waste Management's Debt Service Fund budget request say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. Now on to the A3. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 1215 <laughs> solid waste management non reverting capital category requests of $45,515 in the capital category for a total of $45,515. Second. Uh, and actually, would uh, a, a, a quick correction on that: the the forty five thousand four hundred and forty one is the balance uh, of that fund currently, um, but we are are not asking for any appropriations uh, out of this budget for twenty twenty three. Um, it's uh, uh, based based on uh, advice from DLGF. Uh, they, they, they've recommended to us that even if we're not seeking any appropriations or, or, or revenues for that matter into the capital improvement fund, that we do uh, go ahead and seek uh, the adoption of a zero sum budget. That way we have the budget filed with uh, the state and if something were to happen during the year where we felt the need to seek an appropriation to repair a building from storm damage or something, uh, the budget's on the file and mm -hmm. we can just seek the additional appropriation. All right. So, so you read that, um, Mr. Deckard, you read that as a forty-five thousand dollar appropriation. That is not correct. Yes. So, all right. Well, Council, I move that we clarify that the appropriation for uh, this budget is zero. Second. Are there any questions on the motion? All those in favor of zeroing that budget say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. I apologize because that's the way it looks on here. I thought mm. they had put it in the wrong spot. Oh, okay. So. okay. That makes sense. What are the revenue? Uh, you said you don't anticipate revenues into this fund, but I'm sorry. You said you didn't anticipate any revenues into this fund. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Uh, our, our board would always have the option at the end of the year if, if there are unspent appropriations uh, to choose to transfer them uh, into that fund. And I forget what the exact, there's a, a cap on how much they can actually do oh. a percentage of, of the uh, of the operating fund budget. But that, that option does always exist for our board. Uh, to, to, to date, they've never, uh, done that, but it would be an option. Okay. 
Uh, any questions on the budget? Yes. Uh, yes, the, the history of that fund is that one of the previous directors just thought it would be a good idea to have a little fund set aside. And so it isn't just isn't like our Kim cap fund or something of that sort, where it automatically has a rate charged to it. It's just a part of their total. Right? Is yes. that as you recall? Yes. Oh, well, you weren't there, but before you were there, well, he was there. there. I was a well, director. I, I yes. thought it was another director yeah. that did that. It was another director, but yes, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was right. the right. previous director yeah. that established right. the fund, uh, but I, I was with the district at that right. time. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of accepting the solid waste management's non reverting capital fund budget request say aye. 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 All opposed aye. say nay. Motion passes, and that concludes yeah. the binding budget review for the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and now we will go to item B, uh, 5B, 5B, uh, the Monroe Fire Protection District. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 86. 03 special fire general fund category request of $12,410,108 in the personnel category, $479,000 in the supplies category, $1,019,000 in the services category for a total of $13,908,108. Second. Welcome. It's good to see you both. It's good to see you all. My mic on? Yes. Okay. Okay. So just running through the um, budget itself, as many of you are aware, a lot of this has been in the works for several years and we're kind of implementing uh, some things that we discussed with the public. I'm sorry. Could you speak closer to the mic? No problem. Is that better? Maybe. Enunci Maybe enunciate. Okay. <laughs> Just yell at us. Yeah. So <laughs> this budget has been several years in the making. Um, we are basically three years left in what we had for phasing in uh, additional staffing. Um, no big changes this year as far as geographically. Uh, all of the townships that are included in the 2023 budget were also included in the 2023 uh, two budget. So no large curveballs there. Uh, the budget contains a 3% cost of living. Uh, there's a training captain position that has been moved to a 1977 fund firefighter line. The reason there are two firefighter lines is when we had the merger, there are two separate pension bases. Eventually all of those will be 1977 fund, but until they attrition out, um, so that position has moved into that category. Uh, this budget includes six additional firefighters um, and that increase applies across several lines uh, to include the incentive qualifications, the officer pay, uh, substitute emergency overtime training and special event, uniform allowance, the health insurance, that PERF 77 fund employer contribution and life insurance also impacts the holiday pay as two additional firefighters on duty. Um, each holiday would require additional uh, incentive there. Changes to the administrative assistance line. Uh, the 2022 budget was based on presumed job description, uh, looking at the PAT-5. Uh, this now reflects what is referred to as the PAT-D. Lost my life. There are 24 firefighters in that per fund uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, and 68 in that 1977 fund. Uh, medical services is based on the estimations that we received. Majority of that cost is the annual firefighter physicals. Most of those are required for hazardous materials, but the department applies that to every member of the department to uh, prevent any medical emergencies amongst our staff. We do have some retirements coming up in 2023. Uh, the district in 
2021 adopted a policy that allowed for those who retired early and met certain criteria to notify us in advance so that we could budget this early retirement. Uh, the maximum eligible benefit is $25,000 each, and both are eligible for the maximum at this time. If there are any delays in their retirement, uh, that amount does diminish. In the supplies category, um, we were overwhelmed this year um, at the fair and the spring events that we have attended. The attendance at our booths going through our fire prevention trailer has probably totaled what it has in the last five years combined. A lot of that I think was things slowed down with COVID. People are anxious to get back out and they're comfortable because we're taking all the precautions into consideration and we're providing these kids with an opportunity to learn a lot about fire safety and do so safely. Uh, but with that, uh, we definitely want to increase the promotional fire prevention supplies because the last thing we want to do is run out of those materials in the middle of these events and miss out on an opportunity to send some documents home that really then educates those adults living in those households on some of the fire prevention uh, material that we covered uh, with the kids. And there are adults that go through these things too. So don't be shy if you see the fire prevention trailer, uh, but it is geared towards the children. Um, EMS supplies, again, last year we had a, a slight increase um, and we're looking at potentially in 2023, getting something done with a fire station in Washington Township. There's no guarantee that will happen, but the township has provided the district with some funding and we are looking for additional revenue sources to potentially make that a possibility. So EMS supplies, we have continued to look at the, the needs of those eight stations. The IVFA dues straightforward, the more volunteers, the more members we have on the roster, the more uh, we need to pay those dues. And we anticipate 2023, the roster reaching 170 people. Fuel, fun topic I'm sure you've heard about the last couple of weeks. Um, same problems here. Fortunately, things are starting to go down, but this, this year has been very difficult. Um, some fire apparatus get six miles per gallon. And it's extremely difficult to factor these things. We have kept them in the firehouses as much as possible this year. We've cut back on the amount of travel to go to training and, and planned events. Um, but when fuel doubles, it really, when the tones drop, they have to go. Um, we did add a collar guard um, line to the supplies category. And the collar guard stuff really has to do with different presentations that we have at events. Um, it's, it's almost difficult to say, but as you are all aware, we've experienced some losses over the last few years in Monroe County uh, with first responders. And we found that a lot of the things required to fulfill some of these ceremonial obligations, we were borrowing from other places throughout the state of Indiana. And we wanna make sure that, that our folks have the things they need to train with in advance and be prepared for these types of uh, events. So that's the collar guard supplies category is new, um, but we did reduce the fire inspection and investigation supplies line in the same amount. So it's not an increase to that category. We, we just felt a better need uh, for that funding. And, and this isn't something that just happens at those types of events. I mean, public events that are occurring anyway, we'll be able there to provide those types of services. The services category, um, legal expenses uh, based on 2022 and anticipated costs. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about a Indiana Fire Protection Districts Association and this would help us be a part of that. It also pays for our required audits. A postage and fees reduced on the actuals for 2022 uh, on the first half. And then general insurance uh, based on the estimates that we have gotten. However, the estimates are kind of pre-estimates because we can't get an actual hard figure out uh, in advance because of the January 1 renewals. So we are as close on those as we can be based on the data now. Hopefully things trend in our favor 
over the next few months. And then workers' compensation, we do anticipate an increase based on the larger footprint of the district, the more employees that we've had, it's been an increased uh, amount of claims. Uh, the previous wage or, uh, rates were determined based off the district's smaller footprint. So obviously the, the claims in those years leading up to the merger seem to be drastically lower than what's realistic. That's it, all I have to present for the general fund. Thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments to my right? You to my left? Yes, Councilman McKim. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have well, I, Yes, oh. I was just gonna ask you if you could share with us the starting pay uh, for your uh, entry level firefighters is. I mean, when I'm looking at this, everything is so combined together, you can't really tell. Put up directly. It's sixty three thousand six hundred and fifty four. I'm sorry, sixty three six fifty. Uh, sixty three six fifty four. Six fifty four. For twenty twenty three. And then there's certifications or something on top of that. I mean, that's the base pay, right? Yeah. So that's the base pay for every firefighter at the district. On top of that, those lines for incentive qualifications kick in. Uh, those with um, educational achievements receive a stipend. Uh, there is hazardous materials technician training, uh, some other specialized training in which there's additional incentive. Uh, there's a longevity that tax on to that. It's $150 per year. And then the officer pay, depending on the position that that individual holds, uh, there's an increased amount there. I just uh, understand there's going to be a substantial raise in other areas uh, for firefighters, and I just wanted to see how it was going to compare with the fire district. Yeah, so, um, so one thing to point out on that, the 3% cost of living applies to that base salary you're referring to. The officer pays the longevity and the officer, I'm sorry, the incentive qualifications, the officer pay and the longevity remain the same. There's no cost of living adjustment on those. Makes sense. Are there, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I guess, uh, can you put this budget in particular kind of in the context of your plan for fully building out the, the department? Because obviously just because of the way that it works, we've seen the levy fluctuate around a lot. We've seen a pretty substantial levy increase since last year. But actually, over two years, it's only right. what two, two and a half, two point nine percent. Yeah. So the the plan is to have everything phased in um, with the twenty twenty five budget. After the twenty twenty five budget, the hiring will cease. So there would be an additional six firefighters in twenty twenty four, and an additional eight firefighters to close it out in twenty twenty five. Yeah, so one, one thing that changes in this year too with the levy is that we have had um, the benefit of a assistance to firefighters grant that we received in 2019 that will expire this year or in this budget cycle. So one reason that you see some personnel cost increases with the levy is that we've had other revenue sources that, that are expiring. Okay, thanks. Yep. And there's a second in 2024, <laughs> The second grant expires, I believe, the three-year period's up. No, 2024. Yeah. Okay, so, but, but 2025 is when you consider yourself to be in steady state, you fully implemented. Correct. The plan and that you presented to the public. Yeah, and I'm gonna work on a document. The document that we've been living off of was a 2021 to 2025 budget document. I'm gonna start working on the trending for the five years following 2025 um, so that we can present that and I can probably have that available by the end of this month. Um, it's just not something that I've started on. One thing that was pointed out a couple of weeks ago, I neglected last year um, when we did that 2021 through 2025 to include the additional staffing in the personnel lines of those projections for 2024, 2025. So the numbers that were originally on those were based off of the estimated uh, growth factors of each year, and it did not include those phasing ends. 
Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think that would be very useful to update all those numbers for the public. Let me, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, I wanted to go down into um, uh, your EMS supplies uh, and it, it jogged my memory a little bit. Seeing that go up, um, it made me think of a conversation that, that we've had uh, about how um, the, you, you folks are often the first to arrive at a scene and sometimes you just don't have the supplies you need to be able to you know, deal with the situation. Uh, and I wondered, if, could you talk a little bit about how um, what the need is for additional EMS in this county and what your plan is to uh, address that? Yeah, so currently we operate as a BLS non-transport service, which means our crews are trained to the EMT basic level. Uh, they respond in a fire apparatus, whether it be an engine or a squad, and they provide medical assistance on the scene. Uh, we don't have the capabilities to provide advanced life support at this time, which would include um, giving medications, um, some additional airway um, possibilities, and we don't have the opportunity to transport. Fire District, since the merger conversations, has been looking into the possibility and the feasibility of providing additional ambulances. The main reason for that is the fact that we just simply don't have enough of them in Monroe County. It's very frequent that Monroe County runs out of ambulances, which means we're waiting for an ambulance to come from Lawrence County, Owen County, Green County, Morgan County, Brown County. Where that's problematic for the fire district is one, we're concerned about the care of our patients, but two, there are additional calls that come in. And the longer we wait on an ambulance, the longer that that fire crew is tied up with a patient awaiting the transport to arrive, load them, take them to the hospital. So it's two-edged. If we're able to transport that patient, we are seeing that there's times that we can certainly arrive on scene, provide that initial care, load the patient, transport to the hospital and return to service faster than we can simply wait on a transport to arrive and relieve us, if you will. And, and so when those if those services come on board and online and it turns out it is feasible, uh, I imagine that you'll need increased staff to handle those services and that the current staff so maybe aren't trained or do I have that right? Yeah, so we, we are actually sending some current staff to uh, the paramedic program. Uh, we've had a fantastic partnership with Ivy Tech Bloomington. Uh, we have four firefighters in their paramedic program right now. Um, so we are working on getting that advanced life support capability so that even if we aren't transporting, we're able to provide those advanced services on the scene, but the end game would be to be able to transport. Um, as far as the staffing goes, it's kind of a temporary dilemma because this, the model that we're most closely looking at and interested in that we think will fit this county the most in the fire district is also being utilized in Johnson County by White River Township Fire Department. And those staff uh, members are civilian paramedics. Uh, there were some that were crossovers, uh, but those individuals work on the ambulance. They make these medical calls, they transport these patients. But then there's also a billing factor that comes in for the EMS service. That bill is basically sent to the insurance companies just like the current ambulance service would do um, and there's a revenue stream from those insurance payments. Um, after a certain amount of time, those initial calls will eventually begin trickling in revenue. And I think between six months and a year, it would be self-funded. Hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that, that yeah. vision. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing it, you know, develop over the years here. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that you had that platform to talk about that. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you very much for being here, Chief and Lori. It's always good to see you. I have a couple questions and then I'm, I've got a compliment when it's all said and done. But the first question is, how is your retention with your, your firefighters? How does that go roughly? I, I don't expect you to have a number, but. Yeah, I would say that we've probably lost two to three firefighters since the merger. Uh, some of those firefighters have left the fire service entirely. Uh, some have moved to other fire departments. Um, it's not been a pay issue. Um, there have been 
<laughs> if that's where you're going. <laughs> no, it's not been a pain issue. There, there's been various reasons, uh, but volunteer numbers are drastically higher. Uh, we have really gotten a good partnership with the Hoosier Hills Career Center. A lot of the high school kids who are going through the vocational program are coming directly to the fire district and volunteering. Um, we're able to hire those folks into these part-time positions as we are offsetting some of the part-time positions as we hire these full-timers, the budget has always included the need for some part-time. And the reason for that is so that we can allow folks to volunteer, work part-time, and then obtain a full-time position, more of a promotion than an open process, if you will. And that's really, I think, once we get up and fully running, is a major retention factor for our, our junior staff. Sure. Thank you very much. That's that's interesting. We don't always hear that on, on retention. So I, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, and I never hear any complaints about you uh, in the department, which is that's a, a sign of something good, I would say. And the other thing I was just going to kind of piggyback off what Councillor Iverson is saying about, um, I would be very interested in any ambulance proposals that we can offer that supplement services. I got a a little bit too much of an up close and personal experience with this over um, the last few months with uh, a family member <clears throat> got to learn a lot about current ambulance services and sometimes when we don't have them and i think that this is a good example where somewhere where the county can step in and to piggyback into the sort of a compliment i think that consistently you have articulated a vision for what fire protection emergency services looks like throughout Monroe County. And I, I really see that kind of fitting under that. Um, sometimes I hear people make the remark, well, county's county and city city, but we have a whole lot of people living in the county that expect the good life and amenities of the city. And I think you kind of get that. And you're, you, you have, you've entered not very easy conversations to do what you've done in the last few years and done it very well. I don't hear a lot of complaints and I, I, I think this would be an area too to look at as well. Well, and if I can add to that, I, I don't think any ambulance service that the fire district would put into service would be limited to just the county. Okay. Um, the ambulances in the city are gonna run out too. And obviously if we're closer than Lawrence County, Brown County, wherever, we will go. Um, so I think it's a benefit for the entire county to put more ambulances on the street, whether it's the fire district doing that it's IU Health doing that. It's it's other outside companies coming in. The goal is to get more ambulances on our streets, and we need to do that sooner rather than later. Yeah. And the very last thing, and I swear I'll be quiet. I appreciate also the effort at these ceremonial events, which are important. It's a sentiment of community value for those that we've lost. And then with these events where you're out there with those supplies, I see see your fires firefighters everywhere and they're doing outreach. I was out at Belt Trace sitting at the nursing home and I watched as residents were watching the 4th of July parade and here comes your truck. And I think that's awesome. I think that's great. It's good outreach. And I think that's helping you to get that word out there and get that good vital stuff. So thank you very much. You've answered my questions in the course. This happens every time. So um, thank you. and. I just want to concur that um, I think that there's a lot of support for additional ambulances in our community. Um, the need is real. And so um, looking forward to hearing more about that. Any other questions? Uh, okay, we'll start with Councilor Hawk. Um, I, I'm just going to ask again, I think I've asked before, and might not ever happen, but I'm, I'm hoping it will, that you could start having your meetings here. Because when I, I tried to watch your meetings at, from where you are, your location, and when the public comes, you can see them sort of sitting in a, a row and there's no way they're hearing what's being said. I mean, it's difficult. I mean, Chief, we love you. You just don't speak up. <laughs> but it's a big grown up man, you need a bigger voice. Um, <laughs> But I'm just saying in, it's hard to hear in those meetings. And here we have, I mean, the county has paid for this great meeting room and all of this great um, equipment. And 
we have a huge amount of people of this county that's relying on you and want to be interested in what you're doing. And I just think it would be appropriate for you to have your meetings here and the public would have a better chance, even if they're not here in person. I think if, if it's here and it's recorded and it's going on cats and people can actually hear what's going on, there'll be a greater interest. And since it's the people paying the dues, I think we, we could do that. Um, that is something we'll certainly look into. And, so, um, and we've discussed because right. we've okay. tried to get into the townships and that's why we've floated the meetings around to the individual townships is to get closer to people. But it has been difficult because the attendance that we've had has been online and our services have been insufficient. So right. I think you'd have a lot more participation uh, on your Zoom meetings if they were here and it was a part of the calendar uh, listed as meeting events. Uh, so I'm saying that to the people who put together our calendar for the county that needs to be in entered. We, we advertise when the Women's Commission is going to meet. I mean, we should at least then understand the fire district is up there being important too. I'm, I'm just speaking for a lot of people who say, but I never know when their meetings are, or, you know, I don't know what they're doing. But what I do appreciate is that all of that information that you put out on Facebook, because folks, you've got a lot of people following what you're doing on Facebook and how many times you are responding to real emergencies, and it's appreciated. Thank you. And Instagram. Well done. <laughs> That's not me. PIO Battalion Chief Jason Allen had all that credit. <laughs> I don't even have Facebook. So I, I was wondering if you could give us a quick update on the status of any uh, automatic aid agreements or lack thereof for other companies. Yeah, I think relations are getting closer. Um, we just had some conversations with Ellisville about our, our automatic aid. Uh, I don't know on, on Bloomington. I mean, I'm, I'm totally interested in starting it tomorrow if, if able, but I need them to be willing to do that. So, so what still has to happen with Ellettsville? Nothing with Ellettsville. So Ellettsville, it's, it's, we, yeah, we so the issue that we ran in, um, hopefully people watching are aware of this. If, if you were in certain parts of Bloomington Township that are within five miles of an Ellettsville fire station, ISO did not have a portion of that uploaded into their mapping. As of a couple of weeks ago, that has been sent to ISO, but we are waiting them to tell us it is officially uploaded. Okay, so there really was just a glitch with ISO. There was, was a glitch. An issue with the automatic aid. That is correct. Okay, thank you. It's unfortunate that we haven't moved further with, uh, with the city, but uh, mm -hmm. I think we'd probably all like to see that kind of- We'll get there. You know, good, thank you. Oh, Councilor Munson. <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up on the uh, discussion about ambulance service because the county used to have an ambulance advisory board. I served on this with Charlotte Zitlow and the information was collected and recorded uh, about responses and needs, et cetera. And people did not think this was an effective board and it, was, it wasn't really doing anything but I think it would be doing something uh, right now if it still existed to help show the, the need and where the need is. Um, and I'm sorry that it has disappeared. But I just want, I just want uh, the council and the public to know this. Good point. Um, any other comments or questions? No? Okay. All those in favor of accepting the Monroe Fire Protection District Special Fire General Fund budget requests, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. <coughs> and now we move to the next of their budgets. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 8691, Special Fire Cumulative Fire Fund. Category requests of, in the capital category, 1028000 
$766 for a total of $1,028,766. Second. All right. So this fund pretty much encompasses all of our capital type expenses. Um, something that the district has used this fund for is to avoid debt service funds when we had to buy something that was large, to avoid bonding when we had to buy something that was large. So this fund, um, which is reset on an annual basis, and now that the state statutes actually changed so that the fund rate stays the same, is based on um, the same rate each year. And it funds our small vehicles, which replaces things such as our squads, our brush trucks, our supports, our utilities, uh, and command vehicles. Um, we use it to buy our miscellaneous equipment, capital outlays. That stuff includes fire hose, emergency lights and sirens, radios, um, various hand tools that are used on a fire or an EMS call, uh, personal protective equipment. The personal protective equipment is referred to by firefighters as PPE. Um, that equipment has a lifetime on it. It's 10 years, and that's established by the National Fire Protection Association, the FBA. And that includes the helmet, the coat, the pants, the boots. For us to stay on that 10-year cycle, we need to buy 20 sets of gear a year. But we also need to budget to buy five to 10 more because there's wear and tear. Things happen on fires that cause damage. Um, we had an incident a couple months ago where a paint company from out of town was in town painting a barn and, and there was a fire involved with one of their vehicles and there was this highly, very strong paint. No, because we couldn't wash it out. <laughs> um, it was covering some of this turnout here. We can't use that. We can't send that into a fire when it damages the, the possible causes. A lot of it was washed out, but I do believe some pieces of equipment had to be replaced. So um, station 21's, a remodel is on this. That's based on the amortization schedule. Um, building renovations. Currently, the biggest renovation that's occurring right now is in Indian Creek Township. Uh, the fire station, uh, Station 23, uh, right there in Kirksville, is being revamped so that uh, the living quarters is much more uh, feasible for the staffing that was not originally there around the clock and is now. Uh, and that project's coming along very well. We expect it to be wrapped up by the end of October. Lots of facelift stuff. If you drive by there, you'll see the garage doors are gone. Those garage doors were sitting there, and now we have <laughs> egress windows for firefighters <laughs> to actually get out of the structure, which we would force someone to follow those building codes as well. So we're bringing it up to code, getting it where it needs to be. Um, and next up will be the fire station down on Kennedy, which is pretty much been as its purpose since 1970. <laughs> um, Rescue 22 is on here. It was a truck that was replaced and this is the payment for that. Uh, Engine 22, which arrived just a couple months ago, it's sitting in the garage off Kennedy Drive uh, being equipped right now. We're running into supply issues. Uh, fire hose is difficult to get in a timely manner right now. So we're awaiting all of the fire hose for that truck. Uh, once that, uh, is here that new truck will be in service and its uh, predecessor will be placed into reserve status. So when things are out of service or being worked on, uh, that truck will respond. And then uh, apparatus replacement. So basically we're slating the replacement of another piece of equipment, um, but probably won't know exactly which piece of equipment we're going to replace until springtime. Uh, with the merger, uh, essentially we didn't have a good history um, I didn't as fire chief as to what was costing us money. Lori and I have really been on top of following where the dollars are going and maintaining equipment. And we'll be using that information to determine uh, what apparatus needs replaced next year. Uh, necessarily. Okay. Uh, are there comments to my list? A question. Yes. Um, so are you now on a, a special rate that will just be a reoccurring rate for your CUME fund? Like, like the county has a CUME fund and there's, you have to reestablish it all the time so that you don't lose it. But, but is that what this is now? Oh, the special district doesn't have to reestablish every year. 
and we're, we set that QMFN at the max rate of 0 0.0333. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is the same rate that the fire district has been at as long as I can recall, even prior to me. There may have been years that it fluctuated to like 0 0.330 or something like that, but it's, it's been at this amount for quite some time. And I will say if we change the use of the QM fund to something ridiculous that's not included in these categories, then it would be preferable for us to reestablish. But as long as the use of the QM fund is for the same uh, line items, the same types of capital purchases, then we don't have to reestablish. Councilor Preston. I was just going to say, um, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Staying on Kennedy Drive, um, I find it very helpful um, <clears throat> that we have one and the renovations that I've seen that it, it has happened over the past few years, even the house um, that was there actually knew the person that lived there before. Um, so I appreciate all the things that you all have done and um, very friendly to my children anytime we roll by and we wave. So I appreciate that. So no comment, just, or no question, just saying thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Iverson. Yeah, I, I have a question at the, the bottom there um, for the, the self-contained breathing apparatus or SCBA uh, zeroed out. Uh, I uh, presume that you have SCBA, uh, but I just wanted to know why it was zeroed. Mm -hmm. So this is a line item that we've had independently in the past because we were um, granted some funding from the LIT, from Public Safety LIT. Um, hopefully someday we may be able to apply and get some of that again as we need to start um, re-evaluating our SBA tanks and stuff. They're very expensive, $1,500 yeah. to $2,000 now each. <clears throat> so as they expire, we try to recertify them as much as we can, but sometimes they're just beyond recertification. So um, we've just left that line there in case there needs to be one year when we just need a large capital um, expenditure for that specific thing. Normally, if we have to repair them or um, replace one off, it'll go under the personal protective equipment. Okay, thanks. One comment just we brought up the SCBA is just to make a note of one way that we've been trying to save some money. Um, those bottles also have a lifetime and it's basically 15 years because they have to be hydrostatically te tested every five years. Um, some new DOT stuff came out and there is a single provider in Colorado that can extend the life of those bottles an additional 15 years, up to an additional 15 years. And Lori has driven a group of bottles out there and I've taken a group of bottles out. So we've had 60 bottles recertified in that process at $300 each. Whereas if we would have bought new bottles, it would have cost about $1,200 a piece. That's great. So wow. there's that's lots of stuff happening in the fire world that's allowing us to cut some costs. Um, the air packs themselves though aren't that, that, that case. When they hit their lifetime, they'll need to be replaced. And essentially the entire county will need air, air packs at the same time. <laughs> Well, that last PS lit purchase pretty much bought them for every department in the county. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's a thought. Which just begs the question of at what point do we start maybe planning for that and allocating? So the difficult thing for the air packs is they're essentially the firefighters lifeline in a fire and they train diligently to be familiar with them. These manufacturers change this stuff every few years. And if we don't buy the exact same packs five years down the road, you may be buying a pack that's compatible, but the firefighters aren't as familiar with it. So this is one of those really difficult capital expenses that I mean, it's almost if we could set the money aside on an annual basis to make right. the purchase, it would work. But the purchases themselves really make the most sense buying the air packs together yeah. just for uniformity. Yeah. Okay. 
Any more questions or comments? Council? No? All right. Um, all those in favor of accepting the Monroe Fire Protection District Special Fire Cumulative Fire Fund budget request, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes, and that concludes the binding budget review Thank from you. Monroe Fire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so closing out the um, binding review portion of tonight's meeting and formally opening the 2023 budget reviews for the county. Council Decker. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 1000-0008 general fund assessor category requests of $943,563 in the personnel category for a total of $943,563. Um, second, but I think you meant 934560 Oh, I have a transcription on my transcription. <laughs> Let me restate that, my friends. For fund 1000008 general fund assessor, it should be 934563 in the personnel category for a total of 934563 Where'd that three come from? I also don't have a three. Second. What? I, yeah. We're gonna check with the referees to see what we got here. <laughs> About three dollars. Go for a hot dog and a coke. <laughs> that does sound good. It does. <laughs> we can do an advertisement if you want. Yeah, I agree. I was about six miles off on that one. Well, okay. My fingers were way off, so. It's been a long week, Kim. All right, for fun 1008, general fund assessor, she's got a category request in the personnel category of $934,560. And a total of $934,560. Second, third time's a charm. Which one was higher, you or <laughs> It was $3. Okay. May, may, I, uh, okay. may I protest if I went down there? <laughs> Thank you all. It's a pleasure to see you all this evening. Um, don't think I've been up here since last year. Maybe, maybe one time. In a while, so yeah. but it looks nice. I hadn't been up here for a while with all the TDs. Um, didn't do anything but what you told me to do. So the budget um, just reflects the five percent increase that we were told. I think Kim's got a funny look on her face. No, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and I do have to uh, commend uh, Kim. We got a an email from her. Was it a week ago that we had made a three dollar error? in uh, calculations. <laughs> I'm not sure where, but it was in FICA. It was FICA. Maybe that's where that three dollars. Oh, yeah. that three dollars. Okay. It all becomes clear. clear. Make it on the spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we fixed that and I appreciate the heads up. I felt like an idiot, but apparently she said it happened all over all over the county. So I didn't feel too bad. Yeah. So any questions uh, right now? Um, you, I'm set for 14 of us, including myself. I'm actually 13, including myself. I'm going to leave that position open for a while. I'm tired of hiring. Just to be very honest with you, I am tired of, of the hassle of trying to find people to work. It's been a rough year and a half. Yeah. And um, right now the office is, is, is doing well. The people that I have hired uh, recently have just turned out to be a delight and so far they're lasting more than a month so hey don't ask much more than can you work <laughs> a month <laughs> um no it's just uh, the office is doing well I, i've sent you all of my figures you've seen how busy we've been to put a two billion plus dollar uh never happen i doubt if it ever happens again i'm pushing a billion i think for the next um year could be higher uh, every time I turn around, there's a new apartment complex. Um, mm -hmm. We've been out on East Third uh, Street. It's really scary uh, what's happening at Kmart. I don't know how many students are going to be coming out of that onto Third Street. And now the Bill C. Brown property between uh, 
the Chinese place and Bill Brown sold and it's going to be another 200 or 300 students. I don't know I can get to work. I might have to go to Lawrence County and call in. Um, I'm not going to be able to get out there. <laughs> um, so anybody that lives on the east side, we got to find another way of getting to work. Um, That's right. Especially since they changed the third street to two lanes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but we're doing well down there. Um, I can report on um, on my uh, hearings right now because I think Marty has called me both days in the middle of hearings, but that's all right. I have nothing else to do. Uh, no, she, bless her heart. She's, uh, I got good questions. Um, the board has been meeting, um, well, ever since July, we, we come into session. We want enough time to get all the informals out. We had about 500 people actually call in out of, geez, what, 70,000 parcels when you look at personal property, uh, real estate, and all of the other exempt, non exempts and all that stuff. We had about 500 uh, coming to the board. We might be at 50. That's it. I'm either so low where people have given up to. <laughs> I mean, really, seriously, think about it. All of the parcels we have, I have 50 appeals going before the board of review. And we kind of wrapped it up today. We've got two more days in October because we can't get people to call us back or even show up. So we give them two or three chances. We'll see who shows up in October. And then we have a day, another day where we wrap up everything with the board uh, and uh, go from there. But um, you can't ask for better than that. Have I given away a lot? Not really. Um, on the, on the, uh, we had commercial today. We had commercial yesterday. The commercial people don't get back to me till the very last minute. Um, we've taken a few under advisement. We give a, a couple of hundred thousand here and there, which is nothing. It really isn't when you're talking millions. Um, but we'll give you an updated list. When it's all said and done, we have to send it to the state. We are actually expanding what we give to the state uh, because I didn't think it was, it was enough information. So we're kind of expanding that spreadsheet and uh, the state's requesting it from all the assessors now. So we'll see, but we'll give you all of that. And, you know, I just really encourage you guys to um, maybe pop in on, a, on an appeal every once in a while, they're open. I mean, you don't, yeah, no, you're not doing anything else. Uh, you could pop in. Um, one of the things that has happened to the board, which I, um, I'm, it's not gonna do any good that I complain. Uh, I've complained for the last three years. The state put the homestead appeals onto the property tax assessment board of review. We have nothing to do with homesteads. That's an auditor's function. Mm -hmm. If they deny a homestead, they're making the board hear it. Mm -hmm. So that's just been a pleasure. And uh, we never give it because the auditor isn't messing up on that. Um, you're removing them because they don't, they shouldn't have one. And um, so the auditor's office, the Stephanie and um, the other lady, I can remember, she's really cute, Lindsay, um, pops in and they just sit there and smile, you know, and the board says no. Couple went to the state and the state overturned the auditor or overturned the board, I should say. So that's a little bit, they're not doing that many. We had, we've had quite a few, but that's another thing that the board was not set up to do. So we have to do that. Um, well, if I may take one minute, I think you know that my, my budget's pretty easy to figure. One of the things that has come up is on my board of appeals. It's a four man board. Um, and uh, anyway, um, Jack Davis is the president. He has been our president for quite a number of years. And you've all know Jack, you've got to um, absolutely a phenomenal person that is so great with the public. And he is the president and he never, he has never missed a meeting. I mean, that happens sometimes you have to, uh, but he goes over and above. Um, and then I also have um, another one, um, Vicki Reeves, who used to work for me 
And when she retired, I talked her into coming on the board because she's certified. She has a level two certification. And the law says we shall have somebody on the board other than me. And I'm not a voting member, but I have to be a level three. But I need a board member that's a level two. And Vicki is. And um, I've thought about this and I haven't brought it up to you during the summer, but it really came apparent yesterday. Jack mentioned uh, my range right now, it's just a range for board members. It is um, 19 to $24 uh, an hour. And I believe and you'd have to ask him this. I think that's sort of a range that most boards fall under, but most boards don't do what we do and have to have the knowledge. And um, so what I was gonna suggest to you, and don't you don't have to do it today, you can think about it um, because it would be for next year anyway, that maybe give Vicki, since she has the level two, the same certification pay that I give all the other level twos. She's earned it. She's worth her weight in gold. Um, never misses a meeting either. And then on Jack, I would like to, what I would like to do is raise that uh, range from $19 to 21 to 30, because I think as president of the board, I don't know, think that all presidents, you know, get a higher, but he really goes over and above. Just to give you an example, um, and you're probably going to be hearing about this. We go out in the field a lot, and I go out in the field all the time. Uh, are you familiar with the Gene B. Glick Foundation? Mm -hmm. um, they have about a half a dozen apartment complex here in Monroe County, and they're all Section 42, so they're low income. And um, I've gotten to know them very well because I've dealt with them for so many years. And they just bought um, Country View, which is 2500 South Rockport. A uh, real challenge that they have thrown their uh, money, their time, their resources into. And they purchased it uh, about a year ago. And they, they came to the board um, last month to ask for some consideration of tax exemption. Not 100%. We don't give 100% on these apartment complexes. But to give you an example, the reserve up on 17th Street that goes into uh, Crescent, uh, drive, you know where it is on the right hand side. That was a very, very challenging property that Gene B. Glick bought of quite a few years ago. And it was run down. It was police calls two or three times a day. Ambulances, it wasn't safe. Um, so they bought it. And I had never really dealt with them until they bought that. And they started coming in and I didn't know that much about it. I know you all know Gene B. Glick is one of the largest real estate companies probably in America, but they have taken all of their money and it's still family owned. Um, and they have created this foundation that they're gonna come into communities and put their money into helping the poorest of the poor. And everybody around here keeps saying, what are you doing for low income? This is a perfect example of a private entity actually putting their money where their mouth is. And they're doing it here. They do it a lot of places. They're doing it all over Indiana and probably even out of state. But here in Monroe County, the reserve was the first one that I worked with them on. And it took the board uh, probably about 10 years of working with them because they would come in and ask for tax exemption and we'd say, why? and they would invite us out. So we spent a lot of time out there uh, with them. And we started at 20%, 40%, and we have now ended up at 60% on the reserve. Then we'll come back. They're not gonna come back and ask for any more. But you cannot believe what that, that reserve is like. It's safe, it's a family. Unfortunately, or whatever, I'm not here to judge, but it seems like when you go into these low income areas, it's single mothers with children, two or three children, and they're struggling. And Jimmy Glick at the reserve has a Head Start program that they've run right there. These kids and the families do not go hungry. They feed them lunch and, bre uh, lunch and uh, breakfast every day, um, that there's something there and they, they're so neat about it. They don't make people feel like they're giving something, but they make enough that the parents are invited in the afternoon and that's usually a barbecue or something. 
they do this. This is out of their money. And um, they have a learning center. They have just everything that you could possibly want. They, and it's, they went in and rehabbed these houses. They're safe. There's a police officer that lives on the site, BPD, which I think is very important. That's the reserve. No problems up there now. They have bought Country View. And I think you all know Country View is a challenge. Uh, the police, the fire, the emergency service in and out all day long. Since they have bought it, they have already started cleaning up outside. They invited us out for a uh, visit last week and it was myself and uh, my two deputies that go out all the time. And of course, Jack, unfortunately, Vicki was gonna go, but we're gonna go back. But Vicki had a, a, a personal issue at home she had to deal with. We went out and I could not believe how they'd already cleaned the place up. And they had all the services that we need. Uh, the community, uh, community kitchen was there health department, you name it, everybody was out there with the people and they had bounce houses. And it was so neat because you saw the people coming out and interacting with each other. I've gone up there for years. They didn't interact. They were afraid to come out. They've already started cleaning up, but um, we're not going to give them tax exemption. Uh, they called me later and said, can you hold it? Because they're gonna go to the city to try to do a pilot. And I'm, I think that's great. And they wanna pay the city about what their taxes are this year, which is like 68, 69,000. They want the pilot for that, but they're gonna to have to put 7 million to start in this. The most they've ever had to put in is less than a million. This, how, this place is that bad. So that's just what we do. And I went on, but I would like for you to think about giving my board a little bit, have, let me have a little bit more leeway and really, giving these people that put their heart and soul in this job. Couldn't do it without them, can't do it without them. So that's all I wanna say on that. So do you have any other questions? I'm sorry, <laughs> I went over my, I'm no, just now 15 minutes, so. That was interesting, thank you. Are there questions or comments for the assessor? Thank like, you. No? Okay. All those in favor of accepting the assessor's general fund budget request say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. Sales disclosure. Council, I moved open for discussion and review fund 11310000 sales disclosure fund category requests of $50,343 in the personnel category, $15,000 in the services category for a total of $65,343. Oh. Second. Okay. It went up just a little bit. I think we upped, uh, what did we up? Oh, FICA, insure, self-insure, that stuff, FICA. Uh, the sales disclosure deputy um, went up a little bit. That's the 5%, I guess. So that's it. That's the only reason it went up. Sales disclosures are not slowing down. Everybody thinks the world's coming to an end, but not in Monroe County. Um, you know, we might have one week of just a half a page in the newspaper, the next week we'll have a page and a half. So um, we're busy. The only thing I can tell the public, and I tell the public this daily, is we're not seeing a loss of value of our real estate in Monroe County. Instead of um, selling out and uh, bidding war within the five minutes of putting it on the market, it's taking maybe a month and they're getting everything they're asking for. I had a house that just sold for $1.1 million. It was listed two months ago for $1.1 million and it sold for $1.1 million. It took two months, but that's nothing. Uh, we got used to selling property in, in five minutes. That's not gonna happen, but our values are not going down. So sales disclosure. Uh, one thing I have done, I have gone from um, three full-time deputies to two and a part-time. Let's try that for a while. So. Are there any questions or comments on the, this budget? No? All right. So all those in favor of accepting the assessor's sales disclosure fund budget request, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Reassessment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 11240000, a reassessment fund category requests of $108,727 in the personnel category, $11,000 in the supplies category, $705,850 in the services category, $10,000 in the capital category, for a total of $835,577. Second. Same old, same old. Uh, lowered it at 5,000 from last year. Uh, we used to have 10,000, I believe, almost 10,000 in office equipment. We moved it down to five. We don't need it. We're not buying anything. And if I do, I just come back and say, I need something. Um, we had to do an adjustment last year and I frankly don't remember why. And that was that, why you see that 4,065, but. We're just requesting five this year. And Jennifer and is anybody else new? If you don't understand this, this reassessment budget is part of the whole frozen levy and everything, but this just doesn't ever stop. In other words, um, anything that's left for this year, for next year, just I don't have to come back and redo it. It just rolls over. Any questions for the assessor? Any questions? Yes, um, go ahead, Councilor Hawk. Uh, we're hearing from other departments that they really needed to increase the postage line. Uh, are you? Don't think so. I'm just, not having any problems. Just wanted you to take a look is, no, at I, that. I don't think I do. Really, seriously, it's going up. Um, no, I've got enough money there. I mean, I send out a lot of postage, but believe me, we watch that and I, I just don't think we do. Well, oh, I know we don't. Another reason. I mean, when we get the form 11s, but don't, don't you have that to never pay changes, postage? but they, they keep, they stay, the form 11 thing, the company that we use is so good with us and they just really try to keep it down. The other thing is part of my, um, the biggest, but the biggest thing is personal property mailings. And um, we've cut that way back because, well, we're not filing anymore. Um, and you know, that, has, that is a big thing next year. We're going from a 40,000 where you don't have to, um, you have to file, but it's just one piece of paper and you don't have taxes on anything for 80,000 and under. So remember that Marty next year, you, your little uh, computer, you won't have to pay any taxes on. She is so good. She, turns that home computer in every year. I think it's $100. And, uh, but uh, anyway, um, so that's happening too. Councilor McKim. So, so why, do you, why do you buy your, or have to buy your own computer hardware? Um, that's does that been, not just come from tech services like every other department? Um, that's been in there. You notice I never use it really. Um, it's been in there forever. Um, used to be you guys, not you all, but the old council, they looked for ways of saving money every which way and it was everything was put in reassessment, mm -hmm. including personnel, you remember that. Um, what that is, is the computer hardware, it's not so much, uh, I'm even trying to think, tablets maybe to go out in the field because we do mm -hmm. use those a little bit, not often. Um, yes, you're right. The tech services has stepped up to the plate and you don't even have to think about stuff now. You're on a continuous loop and they're so, um, they're really great to work with. So and you I, get your normal I get desktop normal computers stuff. from tech, tech yeah. services. Okay. Um, but you never That's know when something's going to pop up. Um, and like I say, I wouldn't use it. I don't, doesn't look like I used it. Did I even use it last year? No, no, okay. I don't. It just sets it there. But you never know when you guys might want me to do something and I can move funds around. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. The Peterboa line there, that's the line you were referring to earlier that pays your board members. I'm sorry, I'm is, so sorry. Is this the line that pays the board members? No, ma'am, it's the reassessment. Is this reassessment? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, right there it is. 
Okay. Um, yeah. You see the uh, this this is the fund reassessment is where we pay our level money out level two level three and that's where we pay the board members. Yeah. Okay. And it has perfect. been you can see where it's been for. We raised it. We always keep thinking we're going to have a lot of appeals, and right now we're under two thousand dollars that we've used. Okay. So. I just don't ever think we're going to hit 10, but once again, that's an area that we just kind of leave it. And if we need to move money around when, mm -hmm. when something happens, um, okay. yes, ma'am, that's where all of that is. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. So are, are you asking us, I mean, you mentioned that you would like to see a change in the salary range, which we would do on this salary ordinance. Um, which would come out of the reassessment. I'm sorry. Yeah, but we just have a line item of ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars, but that range is what I need to fix. She wants us to amend the range on the salary ordinance. You, your you budget's enough, in other words. Oh gosh, you're yeah. saying that's enough. You just well, yeah, ten thousand dollars. I'm not even up to two thousand this year, so I'm asking for to give Vicky my level two, and if I would have anybody else that would come in after, let's say I lose Vicky to make that because that's that's very so, so well when we do the salary ordinance we might want to consider a, increase that, that would range be nice is what you're asking that right, right. that's all okay. i'm asking and, oh, so uh, with that when when i create the salary ordinance and i'll send the uh, copies to the departments and they can proof it and make any adjustments then so right. okay. that's what she'll i would have need the to. opportunity to edit what i've got so that's then, yeah because mm -hmm. this you know the people board it isn't like uh you know we're required we are required to have that and and it's really pretty heavy lifting uh because they're talking to their friends and neighbors that could come in and they have to be very professional and follow the rules um, so i think it's appropriate that they are paid in in a manner that will reward them for doing that well, and also, and I think you guys know this, but maybe I need to tell the public, these people have to go to classes. Vicki has to keep her 30 hours of certification, but Jack goes to conferences, Lindsay goes to conferences, uh, and they set through continuing education, and it's professional. We've got to have that because you know that the number one target in the state legislature every year is property tax, and it's the assessors, and they change our rules and regulations yearly. And we have to stay on top of that. And the board, the board of review and appeals are a whole different ballgame than anything else. And I need educated, caring people, and I have them right now. And it scares me to death to have to lose any of them. They're not, they're not easily replaceable. Okay. Comments, questions, we're good. Okay, all those in favor of accepting the assessor's reassessment fund budget requests say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. And that concludes your Thank budget you, review. Commissioner, uh, council people. I almost pr promoted you to commissioners um, <laughs> or demoted, I'm not sure. No comment. <laughs> uh, and I have to uh, say thank you to Marty Hawk, who's been my rep for years. She gets it, she actually goes out with us when we go out in the field. And uh, it's, it's fun when we go out together because everybody knows Marty. And so, but anyway, that, uh, that offers to any of you that wanna go out with me. And you know, I have a car now. Yeah, it's kind of scary, but uh, I have a car and I appreciate that for you. And I think it was the commissioners, but very much so. Thank you all. Thank, thank, thank you. you. And not only that, they had the most comfortable chairs in the whole building. They do. I mean, the cha your chairs. I'm just saying, go in there. They have comfortable chairs. They're only, uh, what, 15 years now? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then we move to item 7A, the convention center. Right. And the council. Their equipment. Oh, clean. That, whole, that whole office is spotless. It is. Council, I am <clears throat> moved to open for discussion and review fund 4005000 Convention Center Operating Fund category requests of $594,000 in the services category for a total of 
$594,000. Second. Welcome, welcome, and welcome. It's good to see you all. Much better. Yeah. Um, I'm Mike Campbell. I'm the president of the Convention and Visitors Commission. Uh, to my left is Mike McAfee, uh, who's the executive director of the um, Visit Bloomington. And then to Alicia Kopek, who is um, uh, our leader uh, at the Convention Center. Um, and um, appreciate you having us here today. Uh, to talk through our budgets. Uh, I want to remind uh, this group that the CVC is tasked by this body and by the county to promote and encourage in the county conventions, trade shows, visitors, or special events, and to provide the financing of the facilities to be used by the commission for these purposes. We do this from the 5% innkeepers tax collected from Monroe County hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, and short-term rentals. Uh, none of this comes from county funds. And we have done this since its inception, since this commission was created. By Indiana statute, these funds, their expenditures must be used in support of these stated goals. I'm happy to report hospitality and tourism in Monroe County has recovered. Uh, we are uh, projecting to have the, um, our largest year of tax collections for the innkeeper's tax here in 2020. And if we look at some of the statistics from 2020, uh, which was our last pre-pandemic year, the economic impact report uh, conducted through the state um, cites over $300 million in visitor spending in Monroe County. 60% of that stays locally, does not leave the county. It funds over $114 million in wages and supports over 4,700 related jobs in Monroe County. That was before our biggest revenue producing year which will be this year. So I anticipate that to go up. Okay. Hospitality is a vital industry in this community. And I appreciate you uh, taking the time to run through our budgets. Uh, to start with our first budget, um, I'm gonna turn this up over to, um, to Alicia to talk about uh, 4005. Uh -oh, I don't think your mic works. Does this mic work or is it? Do we... Okay. Um, excellent. Uh, this is the convention center operating account and this revenue uh, that's deposited in this account represents the revenue from the room rentals and percentages that we uh, retain from our various contractors for catering and audiovisual and uh, others, uh, smaller ones. But um, it primarily the expenses out of this are our management contract, um, which we've been there for 32 years and appreciate working with the county. Um, uh, building maintenance, elevator, escalator, liability, insurance, utilities. Um, we are uh, asking for an increase in the management contract this year of um, $20,000. Um, this dollar amount hasn't been increased for at least 13 years. Um, so with uh, insurance, with uh, retirement benefits, with other types of personnel related costs, um, we felt it prudent um, uh, to increase that number. Um, and then um, the other line items uh, are covered uh, for basic repairs and maintenance. Uh, any type of big capital improvements come from a different budget. Uh, but basic, it's a basic operational budget. Thank you. Um, are there questions or comments from council on this budget? 
Am I what? No. Excellent. Okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All those in favor of accepting the convention center's operating fund budget requests, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Uh, convention center tourism. That's you. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 1127-0000 convention visitor tourism fund category requests of $2,307,297 in the services category for a total of $2,307,297. Second. All right. Thank you. Uh, as we're pro proposing this attached budget, uh, there is a measure of uncertainty represented here. Uh, it's our best guess based on what we know and what we don't know will happen in 2023. It's probably always the case with a budget, um, but it seems especially critical this year, which can shape our community for decades to come. 2023 is not unclear because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which caused many of our restaurants, hotels, retail stores, and even event spaces to close or alter its operations drastically as it did in 2020. And it's not because of the uncertain demand. Uh, I mentioned we're having our best year. The term revenge travel has entered the industry lexicon uh, <laughs> as individuals who have um, not taken trips for two years, this is their year. Uh, and we have felt that in Monroe County. Uh, this is uh, indeed, there is indeed some uncertainty uh, in the industry, uh, as we return to a more normal labor supply in the hospitality um, industry. Uh, I've heard it said by some, even from our uh, elected leaders recently in this month, that these jobs are all low paying jobs based on the minimum wage. I can assure you this is not the case. Uh, that is an old construct and no longer valid. Uh, in this market uh, where we are struggling to find workers, uh, I'm not even sure what the minimum wage is anymore. The uncertainty in this budget is primarily derived from the lack of progress and the current impasse over the convention center expansion project. While this project was supported by the county commissioners, county council, the city of Bloomington, the greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, as a primary vehicle for economic growth, it has not progressed in any major way for over 32 months. Despite this, we hold out hope that our elected leaders will come to a workable agreement in the remaining months of 2022 so that in 2023, our industry and the economic benefits it brings to Monroe County, Bloomington, and all neighboring communities that make up our home can begin to be realized. This budget we have for you today is a conservative and responsible proposal that will allow for some flexibility for the CVC to respond to an approved, newly announced expansion project. Or if that seems unlikely to happen again this year, a way to invest in other tourism related economic drivers. You'll see this best represented in the commissioner's expense line item. This also represents a 5% increase to visit Bloomington a 5% increase to DBI for convention center operations. And I did mention it doubles the commissioner's expense. Happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you. Are there questions to my left? Mm -hmm. Not so much a question, it's just a comment. And I just wanna offer once again, my 
full-throated support for expanding the convention center and getting it moving this year. Um, I know my, many of my colleagues have shared similar and they share similar sentiments, but we are very much behind you and very much want to see this move forward. And I, you know, I, I know there were differences, but I was very glad to see that and, and be able to participate in a meeting between the commissioners and the county commissioners in the city uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they were in process for scheduling another one. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, while while there are differences, I I definitely heard signs that uh, there was a path forward. So I'm I'm going to continue to to support that and uh, work towards a, a path forward that everybody can live with. Thank you. Oh, got a lot down here. We'll start with Councillor Munson. First, Mr. Campbell, thank you for clarifying the misinformation about wages in the hospitality industry. This is very important for people to hear. And not only was it stated at uh, the meeting of the uh, city and county regarding the convention center, it was, it was restated in the newspaper. And <clears throat> I just hope people will pick up on this. And uh, thank you all for your service and your dedicated work. Uh, you bring a great deal to Monroe County and your reach actually extends certainly far beyond the city of Bloomington and far beyond Monroe County to the surrounding counties because uh, they benefit from the draw of people who come to visit our wonderful community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, let me just say, uh, I am on record as saying that we need to be bullish about a new convention center. I still hold that. I'm optimistic. I'm an optimistic person. Mm -hmm. I think this is a great budget to be optimistic about. And I think it's, it's, a, it's good to do this. Uh, secondly, I wanted to commend you for your performance or your statements on um, new edition. Uh, I, I felt like that really helped center some of this debate. I think it's important to get a lot of those issues out there. And what I will say, not to the three of you before us, but to those uh, who are watching, is that I, I think that what Mr. McKim said is absolutely true. I think there is room for agreement and we need to stop blaming each other and we need to move on. This, this we, we have to move forward. And I think I should probably stop talking at that point. Thank you. And then, then I'll start. Yeah, and then you'll start, yeah. <laughs> Here it's ruined. Um, I had a quick question before I was gonna make a comment. Mm -hmm. And you can always get back to me if you don't wanna comment now, but as far as getting, um, getting help, getting people to take jobs, stay in jobs, et cetera, what's that like right now? Is it at its worst point? Is it, what are you hearing out there? This fall has been better than it was in the spring. Uh, the spring was um, desperate for the industry. As we um, were struggling with massive amounts of an influx of demand and uh, no one to do those roles. Um, it, it was almost a joke. Uh, for any manager in the building to try to catch them in their office as they were either making beds, cooking breakfast, uh, or both. Uh, in addition to uh, their other duties. Uh, and Talisha could probably speak to that on uh, the event side. Yes, we've burned through four vacuum cleaners. It's been a kind of eye opener. Anyway, um, I want to thank Mike Campbell for leading uh, both organizations through the last three years because, you know, through support, through the PPP loans, through some pretty creative things, we've been able to keep key staff and key positions so that, you know, we're ready to uh, take that next step with the the influx that's coming in um, because you know just the energy to retrain somebody on a lot of the details with uh, customers and their needs uh, uh, anyway just thank you to mike thank you to the council everybody's been pretty supportive and you know we're in a good position now to to go forward and uh to finish off um 
if you are looking for a part-time job in housekeeping, uh, Council Member Deckard, uh, I would be happy to talk with you about a, a position uh, at my facility. I would love to work for you. You'd be an awesome boss. Um, he, I do want to. I want to make a, a kind of overall comment because I think now elected officials in our jobs need to be commenting all the time about the convention center project, which we have frustratingly not been moving forward on. I also am like Councilor Iverson. I am an optimistic person, but I'm also one that's a little bit exasperated because uh, we've been collecting this tax. It is time to do this. Um, people can choke on details, waiting for details and quibbling over details. And as I think I have said before in some of these meetings, I'm not sure there are many people in this county that can remember the details that turned Tom O'Daniel Ford into the convention center that we all enjoyed and I did in the days of my youth. And um, I'll, one thing I do know about this community, and I say this over and over, this people wanna be here, they want to come here, they want to live here. And you all know that well, because you deal with it all the time. And this town and this community is popping right now. You can feel it. We've been in budget hearings, for two weeks, every night I leave and there's not a dull moment in the square. You can't tell a difference between a Sunday night and a Monday night and a Friday night, good date night, whatever. It's popping. And that's a blessing that not every Indiana County has. They do not have it. And I will take anyone in a car and take you two, two, three, four. I'm not going to single out anyone up and we'll go sit and watch. It is awesome. And so any antiquated or different thoughts about that changing. I, if it changes, we have other problems other than a convention center and we don't want that. So I, I'll stop before I mess something up, but I just urge everyone to move. These details are, we're gonna choke on these details and then we will be regretful. And that is not a good thing to be. So thank you. Yes, Councilor Hawk. Uh, yes, uh, yes, some of us remember when it was Tom and Daniel Ford. I worked there <laughs> in accounting when I was 20, I think. Um, so uh, that building is special. And I was with the group that went in with uh, Bill Cook and Steve Ferguson and our friend Bill Finch and walked through Tom and Daniel Ford when the dream was there, well, this could be a convention center. And, and we supported that. And I still remember when I used to help clean that building if the janitor didn't show up because of course you had to do whatever was on hand to do. Um, but I'm just so proud of the way it looks. And what I want to make sure is that we don't get lost in the weeds of what the future is, but we also take care of our present because that's a building to be respected and to be, uh, you know, do everything you can to maintain it and to add to it the, the uh, items that are needed so that you can have really successful meetings there. So, I know you're thinking on that. I just want to make sure we don't lose that. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? No? Well, I'll just echo my full-throated support for expanding the convention center. I've seen the work that you do when I was the liaison to the CDC, really appreciated and learned a lot from you, still learning a lot about what the tourism industry is and how it benefits our community. And as pointed out, the communities around us, it is, you know, maybe trite that the devil is in the details. And some people use that as an excuse to avoid the details or to focus on the details too much. And all that really means is that you got to get to work. And so I hope that's what's happening. And I'm really, I'm really grateful to Councillor McKim and Councillor Munson for being our representatives at those meetings. Um, I was delighted when they said yes, because they bring a wealth of experience and um, can really represent our views well. So 
that's my little speech on the topic. And we have a budget to approve if there are no more comments. All right. All, the, all those in favor of accepting the Convention Center Convention Visitor Tourism Fund budget request, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. And now we move to the debt fund. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 46020000 Convention Center Debt Fund category request of $636,000 in the services category for a total of $636,000. Second. So as a um, point of reference, this loan was undertaken in 2010 originally uh, at the request of the uh, county commissioners, the Monroe County Building Corporation, uh, and partnered with the CVC to use innkeepers tax funds to uh, purchase uh, six plots of land to the immediate east and south of the existing convention center and also to affect a light renovation in the facility itself to bring it up to what at that time was a current standard. Since that time in 2016, we've refinanced that in order to um, make more progress towards the principal. At that point, it was $6.2 million. I'm happy to report after our upcoming payment that we'll make at the end of this month, it will be a balance of $2.2 million of principal left remaining. Great. I would also like to remind this body that we we also financed the 1990 uh, convention center debt, which was the original uh, loan on the building. Uh, and in addition, uh, paid that off in its entirety in 2010. Mm -hmm. And not part of the debt fund, but related in 2019 at the request of the county uh, and the commissioners, we purchased two plots of land adjacent to these six plots that were part of the loan at a cost of $500,000. And this was uh, designated and planned for the expansion uh, project within the convention center. So all this has come from innkeepers tax funds um, and the 636 thousand dollars represents a full year payment on that. Questions or comments to my left? So did you say the balance is 2.2 after after this it's, payment? Yes, Council Hawk, it's just below 2.2 after this upcoming payment at the end of the month. Uh, they made a pledge from the very beginning that the debt is going to be paid for. If the rest of the money that is not enough to operate, whatever, the debt would come first. And of course, we know that's what we have to do, county government as well. And uh, they've never uh, disappointed anyone by not making sure that they honored that pledge. And so. Absolutely, uh, comments? Question? Yeah. I wanted to um, talk about debt because I put debt, I was in debt to Tom O'Daniel before there was a convention center. I drove my 57 Ford pickup <laughs> truck there for multiple repairs because it was so old, it needed multiple repairs. Okay. And I was thrilled that it later became a convention center. I did appreciate the years that I spent serving on the Convention and Visitors Commission to learn more about how we have managed to get to the point where we are now that we've almost paid off all this debt. And we are, have a very healthy financial situation for an expanded convention center. And this is important for the public to know. Um, I joined with my colleagues on this council in supporting the expansion 
And I too uh, am optimistic as all of us are that we will get there. Thank you for your work. Does that mean she owns a part of the convention? So. <laughs> pre pre investment is what that is, I, and I apologize. I I know you're in your comment phase, but I do have one more uh, point to note. Please. And I lost it. Okay. Well, you think about that, and I'm going to turn to my colleagues <laughs> and see if there are any other comments or questions. Come on, we're still in here. Yeah, one more budget anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, I, oh, I, I apologize. I remembered that. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so $636,000 may sound like an awful lot of money, but in order to do an expanded convention center, the amount annually that you would spend on the loan would be much higher than that number. And so any thought that we could pay for that strictly through an innkeeper's tax funds is non-realistic. That's my thought. It's a very good point to consider. Thank you. Other comments? Yes. Yes. Uh is there any consideration for going for a higher innkeeper's tax? Because if you look at some of the other convention centers uh, in the state, you'll see much higher innkeeper's tax than what we have, I believe. So is there any consideration of that? So there are a couple of communities that do have a higher innkeeper's tax than us. Um, and not to speak to all of their economics, but one very large one has an NFL football stadium attached to it um, and funded in part by that and a 2% food and beverage tax, uh, as does Hamilton County. So an increase of 1% in the innkeeper's tax is nowhere near what the 1% increase in a food and beverage tax would be. And part of our role and part of our goal is to encourage and to draw tourism to the area. And if we raise the tax too high, that will limit some of that. And how we look versus other destinations uh, that we compete against regularly. We don't typically compete against Lucas Oil Stadium um, uh, and um, in downtown Indianapolis. Yes, sir. And I actually like to just uh, make a kind of a follow up comment there uh, about competing and with respect to the innkeepers tax. You know, I used to always take the perspective that like no one ever chooses a location based on their, their uh, the rate of the innkeepers tax or the rate of the hotel tax. And that's true for individuals. But when you talk to event planners, they right. most certainly do. They and absolutely having a, do. A, yeah, so if I'm just choosing to visit Chicago, I don't look at what their tax rate is on the hotels before I book a hotel. But yeah, a, gr a group most certainly does look at that and that makes a, makes a big difference. So I think that's kind of important to remember. And isn't that sometimes helped out under that budget called commissioner's expense? When you're trying to work with some of the hoteliers that's just like it's all part of a large package, Marty. And so you're right. Sometimes we do need to add incentives, and that does come from the commissioner's expense. Um, but it's uh, meeting planners have a checklist and a grid that they work off of, uh, and they uh, measure us versus other like communities, and we need to remain competitive. So, no, I don't believe there would be any appetite. Uh, for an increase in that, especially since we already have a funding mechanism for an expanded convention center approved. I just would like for if anyone's listening at home, I doubt it's a beautiful evening, so hopefully they're out enjoying life. Uh, but we're talking about commissioner's expense. It's not Monroe County commissioners. It is Correct. your commission. So a lot Correct. of people start going around calling themselves commissioners and they get confused with the Monroe County commissioners. 
Is that what you want? We actually tried to change our name to the Avengers, <laughs> but that was already, already taken and, and we would have gotten in trouble with Disney. So we just stuck with what we had. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Yeah, like your time. That's fantastic. I love it. Um, I think we are ready for a vote on this one. All those in favor of accepting the Convention Center Debt Fund budget request, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes, and we move to the visitor capital improvement. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 46020000 Convention Visitor capital improvement fund category requests of in the services category one hundred thousand dollars for a total of <laughs> there's a redo coming still zero 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 and that 100 <laughs> right okay let me restate in Fund four nine zero nine zero 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 convention visitor capital improvement fund category requests of hundred thousand dollars in services for a total of one hundred thousand dollars. Second. So this expenditure authorization of a hundred thousand is roughly half of the current existing amount in the um, in the fund currently. And in the event that the current two structures that um, stay under the care of the CBC, this fund is designated to allow larger capital replacement or emergency funds for capital repairs or improvements. This is what Marty was talking about earlier uh, in order to maintain and keep our building current, up to date and, uh, and things working. So were this um, facility to pass to another responsible body, such as a board, this fund would no longer <laughs> be needed from CBC funds. And truthfully, the spending from this account has been in a holding pattern since 2019. As the convention center has remained uncertain, this has become more of an emergency fund, but not really tagged for long-term investment as we wait to see what happens. Once we get some clarity and hopefully progress, we can begin to utilize these funds a little bit better. Questions or comments? Yes. No, not so much question, but just, I, with respect to capital improvements, as you know, um, there is money earmarked in the ARPA plan for capital maintenance of the current facility uh, currently you know, allocated. And I think we, need, we really need to push and move forward with at least getting some of that money out. I know you have some urgent repairs. I know you have some windows that need to be replaced pretty desperately. Uh, we really need to we need we need just need to move forward and, and get it out there. However, as we would look at any kind of expansion, one of the benefits would be to make everything seamlessly flow together. And so the exterior and the interior would want to match. And so repairing something and then tearing it out in two years may not be responsible either. And so we would have to look at that closely. And absolutely, I'm not turning down free money uh, uh, that we could use uh, to, uh, to keep a building current. But as we're looking at it from a plan standpoint, we would want that to uh, work together and not different systems, um, nor a different look and feel. We just need to take care of, of what, we, what we have. Absolutely, well we absolutely. Comments, questions to my right? No? One more? Well, I just want to thank you for your candor. Appreciate it. And um, we will now vote on that budget. So all those in favor of accepting the Convention Center Visitor Capital Improvement Fund budget request, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. 
Motion passes, and that concludes the budget review for the Clinton Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you all. Yes, thank you. And next on our agenda is the county fair. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 100806 general fund fair category requests of $109,380 in the services category for a total of $109,380. Second. And do we have members? They're, they're going to be attending virtually. Yes, I think I see some. Okay, great. Um, Welcome to, I think Jake Cunard is, is with us um, on Zoom. And yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Now I can see you. Okay, great. Yes, I can hear you and see you. Thank you. So what we're asking for is just to do improvements um, to better our fairgrounds. Last year, we got the money to do the, some beef barn our beef barn the walls were just falling apart so we got to do that we got to do a lot of resurfacing and we just we still got repairs that we got to do so we're just doing it for upkeep and uh, try to keep the fair going the way it is this year we had a very successful fair um, everything went good we had perfect weather for it one of the best fairs we've had in years great um are there any questions or comments on this budget from my right? Councilor Munson. I'm happy to comment as the liaison to from the council to the fair board. And I just want to thank the fair board for their hard work uh, that they've done, not just uh, bringing the fair to Monroe County residents and the visitors who come, but the work that they do year round uh, to keep the fairgrounds uh, uh, going and improving so that uh, they are ready for, to be used by, by the public. And um, there are quite a few people on the fair board, but the leadership that are the officers, uh, thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you, we appreciate it. Uh, comments, further comments? Comments to my left? questions about the budget All right well thank you for presenting the budget to us and um i will ask for a vote all those in favor of accepting the county fair board's general fund budget requests say aye aye, aye. aye. all opposed say nay motion passes and that concludes the budget review thank you for being here Now we will move to item nine, which is Monroe County Emergency Dispatch. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 12220000, Monroe County E911 fund category requests of $602,000 in the services category, $50,000 in the capital category, for a total of $652,000. Second. Hello and welcome, Ms. Hensley. Is that better? It is. Okay. So in the 911 fund, our communications contracts um, went down a little bit because uh, the state is build it has been building an ESI net and moving some of the 911 services over onto the EziNet. And that has helped to reduce the communications contract a little bit. Uh, the instruction cost has gone up because we are continuing to build staffing. We have been running over the last couple of years with about 12 or 13, sometimes 14 empty FTEs. And we are now at nine. So we are greatly encouraged by that. Um, the pay increases that the city county working group had had talked about and the city worked on uh, have made a big difference. We, we had been having about 20 people apply in each hiring process. And by the time you get through the interviews and um, 
you know, people see what we really do and decide that that's not for them, uh, it, the numbers go down greatly. This time we had 50 people in this current hiring process and these new staff will start on Monday. So we're excited about that. For next year, we plan to have three hiring processes where we bring on three people each time and fill those nine. We also, one of the changes in the personnel budget that you're gonna see is that we will bring a, a social worker in to, to uh, help us address some of the 988 um, call volume that we might possibly see in some of the mental health calls that we get. And we're encouraged about that. We think that's gonna be a really positive change for dispatch. So with that increased staffing, um, what that does is it increases our, our instruction and training needs to keep up with continuing education and um, to get everybody certified where we need them to. On the, um, the capital outlays, our capital outlays are actually quite large next year, but a big portion of that is going to be from the PS Lit. And um, that's because as we're expanding, uh, we need to bring on more, um, a few more desks, uh, more radio equipment, things like that as we're expanding. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Do you have any more on this budget? No. Okay. All right. I didn't want to cut you off. Um, questions to my left. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you, do you know approximately what kind of revenue we expect in the uh, E911 fund for 2023? The, the last meeting I was in, they said they did not expect it to go down. Um, whether or not they expect it to go up, I have not heard. Okay, do, do you know what it was or what it is for 2022? The revenue in E911, the phone tax money. I know that we're we're in in both budgets in in uh, for for PSAP we're kind of spending down some of the reserves that have been that's built correct. up in the, in the past to and in particular that's allowed us to lower the PSAP rate a little bit but I'm just curious to what degree um, the the six hundred fifty two thousand matches the the expected revenue for this year. Mm. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, um, total receipts as of 12, 2021, um, looks like we have $964,531. I just pulled up a quick report. Does that sound right? That's correct. Cool. And does that pay is quarterly or do we receive that monthly or annually? I pulled up the fastest report, which does not show that. Okay. So that means it together. Okay. So all right. So so basically, what it looks like is we're going to be building up reserve reserves again this year with this budget, and so we'll Correct. kind of be doing the same thing in future years. Then. So, okay. Thank you. Um, Councilor Iverson. Uh, so I have some questions about nine eighty eight, uh, and my first question is: you had mentioned bringing a social worker on. Are you seeing an impact, if any, of 988 on your operations yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, a, a lot of a lot of the logistics between 988 and 911 are still in the conversation stage. Okay. And, and then my second question is uh, my understanding, which may be completely wrong is that 98 calls are now being routed to regional centers. Um, and uh, I guess uh, my question to you is uh, with bringing in, you had mentioned bringing in a social worker uh, at some point, are those calls expected to come to uh, uh, into these local centers uh, as opposed to a regional center or, or how is that going to work in the future? I'm not sure exactly what the community is doing towards maybe building a local 988 center and getting certified in that. Um, but one of the things that 
they're working on is quick transfers back and forth between 988 and 911. So that if somebody does call 988 and the, the call starts to deteriorate, that the 988 operators have very quick access to get it over to us so that we can get additional resources to them quickly. Wonderful. I, I know it's early days, so I appreciate you answering my questions. <laughs> yes, Councilman Hansen. Ms. Hensley, thank you for working so closely with Angie Purdy in county government uh, to work out a plan to best use the reserves that have built up. And we, we know that, that in the future, we may not have those reserves available to us, but it is good to, uh, good to use them and not let them sit idly and uh, go into the, the nether world of, of local finances. Um, congratulations on the increased staffing and best wishes with uh, the additional staffing that you're expecting to get. That's excellent report to hear. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, go ahead. It is, um, the uh, receipts are monthly. There is like a supplemental as well, annually. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? All right, excuse me. Um, all those in favor of accepting the Monroe County E911 fund Budget request, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. My chair just went like this all the way down while I was talking. I know. That's why I laughed. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean any disrespect. Incredible shrinking. It was so bizarre. One in the middle of me talking. It was so strange. I apologize. Um, so that um, concludes the review for E911. And we now move to PSAP Lit Interlocal. Council, I move to open for discussion and review. Fund 4933 000 PSAP Lit Interlocal Fund category requests of in the services category $2,585,000. For a total of $2,585,000. Second. Do you have um, anything you want to tell us about this budget relative to the... No, uh, because the main, the main issue with this budget was the staffing. And I already told you about that to kind of help explain the instruction issue. So... Sure. Are there questions or... Yes, go ahead. And, and just to be clear, we have the detail for this in the Dropbox that we've already reviewed the, de the detail of this budget. This is really just the kind of lump sum transfer from the, the county to the city for the operation of, uh, of the PSAP. So I'm sorry, did, uh, did you say there were nine total new positions or how? Nine empty ones right now. Okay, nine empty. But how many new positions does this budget create? This budget adds three positions. Okay. And we added how many this past year? The NOVAC report had recommended that we increase by nine and a half. So we put it into a three year project. The first year we increased uh, the FTEs by three and a half, last year or this year by three. And so if we, by increasing next year to three, then that puts us at uh, the total recommended of the NOVAC report. Okay, and, and is the social worker included in that or is that an additional? No, that's an so, additional. So you have three, uh, you have, so we will have added one. nine and a half communicators and then, right. one, and then one social worker as well. Yes. And in, any other positions? No. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions to my right? Any further? Nope. All right, council. Um, all those in favor of accepting the PSAP Lit Interlocal Fund budget request, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move to item 11A, final budget discussion. I don't know if it's final. 
Is it ever final? That's a nope. big word. It's a lot of it, it may. <laughs> okay. Sure. Budget budget discussions. Um, so we have reviewed all of the county budget requests for 2023. I think we deserve a little pat on the back. At this time, do we want to proceed with a discussion regarding uh, the proposed 5% COLA increase for 2023? And um, I would entertain a motion to open discussion on that topic if anyone would like to chat. You really want a motion? Okay, uh, so moved. <laughs> I'm happy to have this the, the discussion. Okay, is there a second? Second. Great. Does anyone have anything to say? I'm sorry? Does anyone have anything to say? Well, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I guess my thought um, is that, okay, so so let's back up. We, now we have the, the four Bs that we already had uh, from the beginning of the, se uh, the session that have not changed. I don't think we adjusted anything. So we've got pretty good numbers right now. Um, you know, overall, we're in, we've budgeted a, at least on paper, a deficit in almost every fund. Now, in reality, by the end of the year, it probably doesn't necessarily turn out that way. We always find that we underspend the budget significantly um, each year. But at the same time, we still have large cash balances in many of these funds. I mean, even, you know, with the, in the general fund, uh, north of 40% in the PS lit fund, north of uh, 59, almost 60% uh, operating balance in the, the juvenile coet, 115%. I, I mean, we have, we have cash. We also know that we have, uh, we're concerned about um, retaining employees. And so what, what a, a structural deficit, but yet a substantial cash balance tells me is that in addition to the 5% COLA we've already budgeted, not, not suggesting we replace that, we maybe also consider adding a, uh, a one-time payment to a uh, bonus, if you will, to county employees. Um, you know, I, I had originally uh, thought maybe $1,000 uh, paid over four quarters. Uh, I, I think my, my colleague to the right may have uh, may want to add on to that or modify that number. But I'm th I like the idea of, of uh, paid over four quarters, not added to salary, not added to the base, but paid as a bonus. Um, over four quarters, it kind of acts more like a retention bonus because you know you only get it a quarter at a quarter at a time. Um, it saves us a little money going on vis-a-vis uh, -vis salary because it doesn't uh, we don't pay perf on it. Uh, but then also it doesn't it doesn't make the structural deficit worse by adding on to a ba uh, to the base salary and yet we get some money into county employees pockets. Yeah. So I guess I'd like to know what everybody thinks. And if I can <clears throat> um, to go over with um, what Mr. McKim was saying is I do believe that if we did a, a one time bonus of twelve hundred dollars. Um, for our county employees, um, I, I think that would help. And then also in addition to that, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure if there is any type of retention or employee, I'm sorry, employee um, like bonus. So for example, what I'm saying is um, in terms of employee referral, so if you have somebody that is that you want to bring to the county um, to work, um, you know how other places are able to bring you um, some type of referral bonus. I definitely think that would it, it might help. Um, you know, if we don't have anything like that in plan or in place now, hey, why not try to see what we can do. Um, since we have employees that are leaving for whatever reasons, um, and it's hard to retain people. So I, I would think, you know, a bonus of 1200, um, and maybe something such as a $500 referral for an employee that is hired and stays with us for a longer period of time would 
be something that could be a start to trying to stop the, the flow of employees leaving. I also think that it, in, not, you know, instead of maybe stopping the flow of leaving, that referral is a really cool idea because it, it, it helps our current employees invest in that recruitment, which we've had some, some trouble with. And I think being, oh, look at the, we're getting some looks. Would you like to comment, please? Yes. So you start. Some of my cases might be in regards to this cough drop, so ignore those. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I think we were wondering how it would work in a referral bonus if two county employees both refer the same person. How do you decide who gets the bonus? And do they get the bonus if you're if the idea is the person already employed county person or wait already county employee refers someone new and then the new person has to stay for x period of time does the county employee who made the referral get the bonus when the new person starts or after they've been here for six months like when do you give the bonus so that would be Just determined and the person applying at least in the systems i've seen the person applying for the job indicates who referred them and they indicate one name and then that I mean, we would determine an amount of time. I don't think it should be too terribly long, but I understand. Usually places will have it anywhere between like 90 days up until six months mm -hmm. where somebody would um, get a referral bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Hawk. Okay, first of all, um, I really like the idea of doing a one-time bonus for employees. Um, as I said, what, what month and a half ago uh, that we could work toward that because that doesn't change that base pay. And if, if our, for whatever reason, our revenues would not uh, hold up to what we would like for it to, uh, that wouldn't cause us to have to put maybe lay off people because we'd raise the salaries too high. So I think, you know, to, to add on to that 5% increase, to add it in the form of a bonus uh, and not do it all at one time because you don't want to give them the bonus and then, oh, they get the better job down the road the next day. So uh, I like that part. Here's what I think is really problematic about the, you know, the finders uh, bonus uh, is that we're very different from the city. We are so different from the city because every department head, every elected department head gets to choose their own employees. And uh, so what if somebody says, oh, well, we know X, Y, or Z person, they might like, you know, whatever office. It's just up to the department head to go out and find that. And, and maybe it would work, I don't know, but I'm just thinking you're setting it up, as you said. Generally speaking, we know a lot, the same people, maybe the same neighbors, whatever. And you have two or three people saying, oh, so-and-so would be good. Then what are you gonna split it three ways? I mean, are we gonna have some kind of a committee Oh, let's set up a commission. Let's have a committee to decide who's going to get this money. It's and then, of course, we'll have to pay those board members more. <laughs> Go ahead, Councilor McKenna. I, well, I feel like Councilor Wilts addressed that, that mm -hmm. issue of, of who gets the bonus as the employee who's hired puts on their form who it is. And if that person then wants to split it with you know, a dozen other friends, they're welcome to, but that's kind of not our problem. The, the, and I, I actually like the idea of a referral fee. I'm, I'm totally on board. The question I have is, is that the sort of thing that we would have to work with the commissioners on? Is that, is that essentially a benefit? You know, I know for compensation, we can just make that decision here, but that's a good question. For, a, a, for something like a referral bonus, is that a, a personnel policy that would need to be I think Don't I would have to check to on that and I can let you know um, via email. Okay, thanks. One, one. <clears throat> oh, um, sorry, neglecting this side of the table. 
one of the things that <clears throat> one of the things that I learned in looking at ARPA as uh, handled by other uh, local governments is that uh, they have been giving supplements this year um, to uh, to their employees, and I don't want to I don't want us to discount ARPA as a source of funding for employee supplements. And I think that that is, of course, something we'd want to work with the commissioners on. But um, it is something that uh, wouldn't detract from our bottom line as well. I, I also want to say with regards to a bonus, I know that sometimes those are taxed differently and they show up on your W-2 uh, mm -hmm. differently. So um, I'm going to also work with Molly with regards to how that would be taxed and mm -hmm. how that would uh, affect a, an employee. I, I would think, I don't, I don't know this for sure. I would think it would be sort of like longevity. I mean, isn't, isn't this essentially just increasing longevity for a, for a year? Yeah, mm -hmm. otherwise it works the same. And then it doesn't, you wouldn't have perf or anything. Right, mm -hmm. you did a FICA, but not, would, not perf, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, Council Crossley. It's okay, it's okay. Oh. No, 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 the, the left is important. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> this is the last night of budget, and everybody was slapping. Um, and no, I was just gonna say that. Um, I, I think it would be helpful if we just, you know, implemented this just to see what this would be like. Um, if we don't have anything like this, which it sounds like we don't, um, obviously there are some kinks that can work out, and as. Um, Council Wilson said, it's not really that difficult to set up the parameters in terms of a referral bonus. I've worked in positions where I have had a referral and somebody else referred the same person. And it was all a matter of who the actual person um, referred to. And it's, it's really not that difficult. Um, and you can't cheat the system or anything like that because you'll have rules and procedures to be put into play for something like this to happen. Um, but furthermore, um, I just think it's the it's the least thing that I think that we can do for our county employees. And I know that I mentioned before um, on the first night of budget in terms of implementing some type of paid leave. Um, so this just gives us one more thing if we have to go down the commissioner's route that hopefully um, the commissioners will work with the council in and we can sing Kumbaya together. So I think that's just, what we need to do and what we should try to do. Other comments to my right? Count <laughs> yes. I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. Well, do you want my chair? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if you're if you're willing, well, never mind. All right, I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say. First of all, I, I think it's really important to wear a name badge when I go visit departments. And one of the things that happens when I wear my name badge walking into these departments is that people say, like, I am really needing COLA. I really need a cost of living adjust adjustment. And, <laughs> and, and so, you know, people have different ideas. So I'm, I'm really on board with not only setting COLA at that 5%, but also giving that, that bonus. What my concern was, was uh, what uh, Michelle talked about was the tax implications of a bonus. And particularly, um, I just wanted to make sure that we're talking with, um, with E about this as well, because when there are issues, those issues are gonna go to her. And I just wanna make sure that we're not creating problems for our staff that, uh, I mean, well, whenever we implement a new policy, there's gonna be unforeseen consequences, but uh, it'd be nice to head those off as much as possible. And I think that she would have some good advice in this arena as well. Uh, so to help us craft a uh, reasonable policy. Again, I'm not opposed to offering a, a, a sign on bonus for people that refer people. Um, I think it's, it's a good idea. Councilor Deckard. I was just going to add in, um, I think that we're in a time where people have to have artful solutions to uh, retain people. 
Um, and I think that, uh, for lack of a better term, I think people seeking work or people in positions of employment are in a very important seat right now. And I think that we have to be mindful of that um, and in cities that are not thinking about, it, I think, get themselves in trouble. I very much like the concept of the bonus, a retention bonus that's paid out uh, over the course of a year. I think that there's something to that that reinforces what we have pretty consistently heard from folks. Um, and I like this idea as well about a referral system. We know ourselves, when you're trying to get people on boards and commissions and other things, often it ends up not for anything malicious or anything, but it ends up just being a couple of people that end up having to do the recruiting because everybody else gave up and walked off. And I think for county employment, we certainly hear a siren call that we need people in certain roles. I mean, we, my gosh, we get those emails. If you stacked them up, you could reach that ceiling. And I think all hands on deck in this community would be a good approach to that to consider how we do it. We could even say, I look with the vacancies, I don't see that this would be a, a, an exorbitant pot of dollars, but we could even put a cap if that were a preference we had. But I don't even see that that would be too much of an issue for us. So I, I like the spirit of this. And you know, I, I'll just offer this as a, a child of a ex county employee. I always like it when this council is talking as well as it can to county employees. Those messages are heard. And I think it's important with, that when good things are coming from here as they're able to. For the, the retention bonus, would that be paid to all levels uh, in the, the, the grid? So would uh, EXE get the bonus? Would, you know, that sort of thing. That, that was, that would be my proposal. That would be, and, and, and so that actually brings up the comment that I was gonna make. That was for, my, my thought was that that bonus or that retention bonus was for full-time employees. Do we wanna do half that for part-time? Isn't that kind of the way the vaccine um, incentive was handled? Yeah. With the uh, part-time employees, they get half. So that, that would make yeah. sense. To, to do it that way. Um, and that would that also include elected officials because the elected officials are included in the vaccine. We're not allowed to leave. I mean, that's just so silly. And so, some of us have an election coming up, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really not our choice. I don't know. I think, I don't think we need that. Yeah, I, I, that, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. I certainly. <clears throat> no, the, the, the regular bonus. The, does anybody have a different idea as far as the number, go, uh, the, the amount? Uh, 1,200 is the bid right now. Do I hear 15? Do I hear 15? Do I hear 15? Do I hear 20? Do I hear 1,200? Do we have 1,300 or 1,200? Where did 1,200 come from? It just, just sounded great. $100 a month. It's just something. <laughs> Yeah, okay. just something to think about. So we have 700 something full-time employees, right-ish? Does anyone know the exact? 320 in the general fund. We came and calculated that earlier. 328, right, 328. We have 320 full-time. 328 full-time in the general fund. In the general fund, okay. Obviously there are other funds, Okay, but and now this would not be a part are you saying give a thousand to the probation officers too because Nick, no, i mean yeah you, i mean you've got to say, yes I, you, I mean, you think about this like, think about what mayor and deputies doing. i mean there's all sorts of yeah. questions here we have i mean absolutely yes i, think I this honestly is broad based think that's that's those are the departments that we're hearing so too. it's to all of the elected officials and and no none of the i don't necessarily care no. about no no wait elected. wait not elected. we're talking the bonus or the referral the i don't bonus. really care the bonus would be everybody not the elected, elected. elected. not the elected officials no. but everybody else well we haven't finished talking about what the elected officials are going to get whatever yeah but um, i don't okay but sorry. what i want as a <laughs> reminder in case anybody has missed it uh it appears I haven't 
The final vote hasn't happened yet, but it appears that Ellisville is giving a $10,000 raise to all full type people. So, a what? $10,000. $10,000. Now, that, that came from several people who want to know. Yeah, my understanding is they're going to use all of their lit the new lit money coming in wow. uh, for <laughs> employee no raises. You know, they don't have a jail to, to build. They don't have we're to obviously build. reserving all of our no. lead for We've at this it. point to- uh, <clears throat> We already have jail. a plan for our revenue. <laughs> that doesn't give us that any and that, options. The reason I'm mentioning is, is because we know how, what's happening with our highway department. With those yeah. drivers with the CDL license, they've already got that CDL license and they can make more money by just, you know, driving to Elksville instead of driving yeah. here from wherever. Uh, I think we I think we've got we have to take a look at at where, as someone from Elksville mentioned to me, put your money where you're bleeding and stop the bleed. And so we have to look at, at that as well. And I mean, I'm just throwing that out there as- Well, are you, suggesting, are you suggesting a higher COLA or a, a is that what you're saying? Or a higher, no. a higher bonus probably. Oh, a, a higher one-time bonus. If we bonus. did, if we raised one, I would just say the higher bonus simply because the colon, it locks you into, that's yeah. where you have to be. Right. And what if your revenue that's, drops? That's what was my next question. I would be concerned. Well, well, what would you, what, what number would you prefer? Oh, you know, we've had $35,000 and you know, <laughs> whatever you vote. Well, no, I'm, that, no, I, I'm you made I'm a, a legitimate I'm suggestion. Really, I mean, What's yeah. a number that would, that I'd like you to can, go higher. Well, I mean, I had to record. close this because my battery yeah, ran out there. Um, and it, we'd have to look at what the total is yeah, because it, if you're yeah. saying a thousand times however many, then if it's two thousand times how what what does that do? We have approximately like Six hundred ish full time employees. I don't have the exact number in front of me. I can't. I so can't, okay. I can't read what she's saying. And does that six hundred ish? Approximately. Okay. Because what I'm saying mm -hmm. here is when we when we look at it in other terms, like our, our salary ordinance, it says well, it doesn't really mean the judges. It doesn't mean the probation officers. It doesn't mean the ones that are already on contract. Well, this bonus. What I'm assuming it means everyone or not or what? I think so. So the six hundred includes sheriff's office, or in and it includes. I mean, we're talking everybody, right? I'm, I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. So six hundred times. It, yes, it doesn't include um, ish. Judges. I get it. I ish acknowledged. Right. It doesn't include judges. Right. Judges are elected. State, yeah, state pay yeah. employees. It, it, judges I would, are elected. I would also suggest that if you are talking to everybody, and you that means you're talking about the the elected official too, because what are you going to do? Give the chief deputy the thousand, two thousand, and not the per, when that's they're already problem. up to ninety percent. I tell you, mm -hmm. you have to look at all of these things. That's why I asked because the chief deputy's salary yeah. you know, tied so to the elected official, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, sure is. Is. it sure is. It is. And I guess I'm, I truly feel like the elected officials are in a different category. And I feel like even though we base chief deputies on elected official salaries relationally, that's different. Go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say, so I agree with Councilor Hawk um, and, and, and putting our money where our mouth is. And I would like to specify that I don't think that elected officials should be a part of this because it kind of, it does it kind of, it does. It makes me feel grimy for us to sit here and to even almost mm -hmm. think about considering them in this mix when we literally have 
department heads that continue to tell us why they're losing people. We're losing people to Catamaran. We're losing people to other counties. We're losing people because people are fed up. We're losing people because they're going into different fields because after COVID, people realize the amount of crap that they won't take anymore. So I don't feel comfortable in including them in, in any of this mix. Um, and that's myself included, I guess. Um, and, and I really want it to go to the people that matter the most. Um, and that's it. How do you feel about just saying not the elected official and not their chief deputy? Because, I mean, I'm, I, you want to give it to everybody, but if we're, if we're not going to give it to the head right. of the department, then the person working for them at 90% going to give them I'm just, and they did get just get a substantial increase going right, to 90%. Right. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, so, uh, because they went from 75% to a 90%. 90%. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So, well, well, so if we, if we excluded <laughs> uh, chief deputies and elected officials, what, what would you think a better number would be? 2,000? 1,500? 2000. Do I, do I get to vote? <laughs> the staff at the table would love it. <laughs> Are we going to discuss the elected official salary too? So maybe we should look at that and, and, and then they'll get tired of watching this meeting and then we can decide what to do with the rest of it. And I have to go home now. I Bye. If I could, I mean, I look, I'm not going to make myself popular with any elected official, which is, uh, seems to be par for the course, but I, I just kind of look at I, the elected officials do have an exceedingly important job. Um, I kind of, though, look at that as a, a secondary discussion to this primary one. And the primary one is the larger pool, I think, of our employees uh, and the people that serve the county. I would my, I think uh, when, when as elected officials, you kind of sign up, take care of the, take care of the ship until everybody's okay. And I, I see that as a kind of a secondary consideration. I, I also, I'm a little hesitant to penalize a chief deputy who can, who's an integral to an office, who will leave, can leave an office, an elected official, if they're if they're committed to the term that they served and the, the thing that they put themselves before the public, they're going to be there for four years. Chief deputy can leave. Um, and I just, I, I guess I'm less hung up on that, that disparity of the county council gave you a bonus and now I can't control this office anymore because of this one retention thing that we're doing. I'm just less hung up on that. I'm also, I'm, I just, I just don't, I, I'm, I'm not getting heartburn over what elected officials make. Every one of us, we signed up knowing that we were here to serve the public and, and that's kind of the gig and there's good days and bad days. So um, public, yeah, anyway, I've said too much. I've said too much. Are other comments or? No, a question. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this bonus, how long is this going to be in effect? for 2023 or for future years? Do you look at this as an, uh, a salary oh, yeah. increase? No. Or simply, simply dealing with the cost of living that is uh, making people struggle? Yeah, the whole advantage to doing it as a bonus is that it's we're not. just talking about this year only. We're not, not making any promises for the future. No. We don't know mm. what the future is going to be like. We know that people need money. It's an inflation supplement. Yeah. Well, we should phrase it that way then, I guess. I like that. Um, yeah, the idea is not to be committed to the future. However, we could change that, you know, should it, should it be something that we want to discuss? Are there other suggestions for employee compensation before I move to well, other well, how do how do we move forward? At what point do you advertise? 
we are going to advertise and send it to, sorry, we're going to different tomato That's what I'm hoping. Mm. We have to have it. We have to have it in Gateway on the 21st. Of this month. Wow. Yes. So that we, because we got to advertise uh, it before the public hearing. So whatever, so we kind of need to know what you want to do. That's six So we can advertise by that. I mean, oh, yeah, let's. Why am I surprised by that? But I mean, we just need to know, hey, we're going to do this. And we advertise high. That doesn't mean we're going to stick with it. That's right. Okay. Oh, I just, remember we that just now. want to make yes. sure we have enough wiggle room for you. Uh, although uh, Council Hawk uh, points out that if, if we're not talking about the elected officials, then we're not really constrained by that deadline because we can always do an additional for the money. We can always, you know, we can amend the salary ordinance at any time. We're not restricted to. Correct. that timeline yeah. for yeah, that's, a good so point. That, that's but, fair we have a little bit of time to I, i'm liking two thousand dollars though i gotta say mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so two but this will at least give us a chance to do some math um right if we, we, okay does anybody object to us doing an analysis on two thousand dollars for employees not counting elected, elected officials or chief deputy no i think okay. that's a really good idea and who are we omitting besides elected officials? You said. I think you just said elected officials and chief deputies. Oh, and chief deputies. Yeah, because okay. they're they're based on the elected mm -hmm. official. And they also just got a substantial increase with the mm -hmm. 90%. The, okay. the only point I might make just for consideration for the council is to remember that most of the elected officials are state employees. In essence, their salary comes from state. The chief deputies are county employees. Well, well that really just applies to the, the chief judges. deputy prosecutor, prosecutor, right? Sheriff. No. no well, no, the sheriff is, is a county employee. Yeah. 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 We're told, right, the yeah. judges and the prosecutor are, are, are not. Okay. We do. We we pay the clerk, the assessor, recorder, surveyor, treasurer, mm -hmm. and we pay all the chief deputies. Yep. That was sorry. There's a there is a good question that is there. Oh. Mm -hmm. Removing the elected, is there anyone being excluded by this that would be fall under some strange state pseudo category weird or federal, I guess? I don't know. None, none right? Molly just made a point that, I mean, we mm -hmm. could do employees would get this right, chief deputies would get this right. We could get it this amount. If we, if we want to compromise. Okay. Thank you. But so to your knowledge, there aren't other employees that we're missing. I just no, don't want to. No. I, okay. Well, I think when we, when we say 600, because that's how many we pay, that includes the elected. Because we pay. Yeah, but that's their, a handful of people. I mean, right. I'm not even. Right. right. That's, it's that's not even, saying, so but I'm not, like, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm yeah. not worried about elected officials. I'm worried about the, you know, probation officers and, yeah. you know, just, I just no, don't no, want no, to no, miss no, something. No, I mean, okay. If we put it in, in all this, of the salary ordinance, we hit every department. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Are there any other 2000, we'll explore, we'll, wait, I'm rushing it. Am I rushing it? No, I mean, I think, I think we probably, we probably need to do a little analysis, but, and, Absolutely. and make sure, and make sure we're There's covering no... all the cases. Yes. Um, 
but yes. I, it seems like there's a general consensus at least consensus at I'm least turn this even, even if not everybody agrees on every single <laughs> well like one one to check out purdue extension is that purdue we have two full-time yeah. employees yeah. with purdue and, and the others are contractual part -time, per know. purdue's employees are not our employees right? they are they, okay. they are not that's a contract okay. yes that okay. so they would be I was hoping. But I, I do think no. there's consensus on yeah. the general framework, and now we just yes. need to check our numbers. Right. Yeah. And, I, I, and I think it's, you know, we need to see what it is, <clears throat> how much it's going to cost for Monroe County employees. So, yes. Um, so, very quickly, that that multiplies out to 1200000 That's the basic cost. That's what I came up with. Oh, I was doing 700. I was like, I have more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to move to, because I'm sensing restlessness. They're like, oh, it's almost over. Um, the elected official salaries. I'm going to go take a bio break. I see what you saw before. Uh, 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 <laughs> the elected official salaries. We could have a vote very quickly. Or very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to call a vote right now. <laughs> Just kidding. Pencil. Just kidding, Jeff. <clears throat> um, I had presented a table of sorts um, that uh, lots of people had worked on. And um, I wanted some feedback on that. We've had a little bit of time with it. Um, I welcome suggestions, criticisms, and um, especially from the staff, if there are things in that that I can't do, well, I like it's all me, that we can't do because of statute, for instance, um, I would like to know about that. I'm going to go ahead and share that. That would be great. Okay. Do you want me to just give you my card? Mm. Mm. Hold on. What did I miss? <laughs> What's... Okay, so this is the table that uh, Councilor Wilson was referring to. Um, and I believe I've edited to what we had talked about with regards to um, having a base amount for all elected officials and then percentage them out year and so um i know that counselor mckim had mentioned that the commissioners you know like 100 percent, but i also included like a 90 and 85 and an 80 but i wanted you to see what is highlighted in yellow and i'm just using the assessor is is the current base rate and for 2022 so the, the assessor, the recorder, the treasurer, did I miss anybody? I'll get that, that rate. So that's mm -hmm. what I was using. Um, and then I just went ahead and included the commissioners, the 5% COLA, where they would end up in 2023 if we just remained with the 5% COLA. So, because I know that's part of this discussion. So, can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this is a little bit of an adjustment from from what I submitted, reflecting that. And I, if you just said this, uh, please tell me because I was distracted. But um, reflecting that 
there are statutory things, things, they're called laws, there's statutory things that, um, that indicate we have to include a certain compensation for the assessor level certifications within the salary. Is that correct? Correct. So IC code 362535 sets out the salary schedule for an assessor. Um, what it says is that a level th uh, an assessor who's obtained a level three certification has to, uh, their salary has to be at least $1,500 more than an assessor at level two. And then for a level two assessor, their salary has to be at least 1,500 more than a level one. So a level, the difference between a level one and a level three would be 3,000. And Kim and I worked on adjusting these numbers. I don't know why I'm pointing. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, in this option, what we did was we made the base salary, the level three assessors, and then subtract it 1,500, which is the least amount per statute to get the level two. And then the level one would make 1,500 less than level two. Now, the alternative option and what I think is the consideration point for council is, do you want the level one assessor to be the base and then your level three would make $3,000 above that or is level three the base and a, the level one makes $3,000 less? The, the statute indicated an increase of 500 for level two or? So I think what you're referencing, the statute sets out salary um, requirements for the county assessor. And then there's a separate requirement under subsection D right. for a deputy assessor. And the deputy assessor is the 500. Long evening, thank you. Oh. Uh, go ahead. I apologize if I missed something um, while I was out, but is, there are also supplements to add to some of these, right? Because right. I had always thought that, yeah, that we wanted a differential with the auditor, a clerk and um, uh, assessor. Correct. Statutorily, so the assessor's a, salary ordinance does not reference a supplement. It just says that their salary must be. Okay, okay. Right, so that's supplement. why, that's why, okay. I mean, we have it, but we hit it because all we're talking about right at this moment is the salary compensation the, part. Yeah, the okay. base and the differentiations. Right. So we would be adjusting the, that supplemental column because right now it's really overcompensating because we're going to have to, we're going to have to include part of the level two and three compensation within that base. If we're, if we're trying to equate these salaries on this kind of grid where we have 100% and then percentages thereof for other positions. It's a flawed system, I'm sure, so I'm open to suggestions and, and input. Just here's what I'm looking at when I'm going looking at uh, uh, go back and look at 2022 to look at this year's, if you will. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, it looks like it's if the assessors at uh, salary does not is not the same it should be the base should be for the assessor should be the same thing uh, it, i think what we had intended for it to be the same as the recorder and the treasurer and then that the additional amount is supposed to be on top of that base it even is. if oh, well then why do you have it down so, as I think that was Ms. Turner King's question was, was just to that point was, should we leave it so that the assessor three is at the same level as the other, those other elected officials? Okay. 
and I, I think I think the way that it's on the grid is the way it should be instead of the inverse, where the level one is the base. Uh, we so on. this is the 2022 salary ordinance specifically calling to the assessors. So you can see the elected official base salary right here is 67,158. And that's the salary that we use for the level three. And then the level two is 1,500 less. And then on top of their that, they yeah, get receive base. on top of, the, of their salary, they receive down here, a level two gets a $2,000 per year supplemental. And a level three gets a five hundred or five thousand dollar per year supplement, which is inclusive of that two thousand. So they only get a max of five thousand on top of that sixty-seven. So they get it on top of the sixty-seven. Right. It's not because so, that's it's a supplemental. It's not included in their wages. Okay, just wanted to make sure because I was looking at that. That's not what it looked like. Not only that, as a reminder, in order to even be sworn in as an assessor, you can't be a level one. I think you already have to be your level two, and you have only just so much time to get your level three. Um, so I don't is I don't know. Other thoughts. Well, I, I had a clarification question. Marty, is, that's correct, right? You you can't stay at level one and be the elected assessor. No, no, you can't. No, you correct. can't even be sworn in. I think you already have to have it. Right? Yeah. See, I don't remember that. But I, I mean, that, that may, right. that's yeah. probably correct. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you can be sworn in, but I think you have a period of time in order to get your level two. So, so yeah, but things have changed, but I don't know. In reading the statute, specifically for a level two, it says if an assessor who takes office with a level two certification attains a level, uh, obtains a level three certification not later than January 1st of the third year of their term of office, they're entitled to the level three compensation. And then it says the same thing for a level two obtaining a level three. So it's January 1st of their third year. It doesn't mention um, what happens if you come in with a level one. It says not later than January 1st of the third year of the term of office. That's also what it says for a level two. Oh, I think that's right. Here I can shift this one. Oh. Yeah, I'm looking in the the most recent candidate guide that tells them the qualifications. It says a candidate who's never been a county assessor, so there's a grandfather clause for an established assessor, must be certified at a level two assessor appraiser to hold office. And to, to take off. Can we see that that grid again? Oh, yes. Please, sorry. So, so I guess the uh, so yeah, you, you. I think everybody knows my position about the commissioners that I think they should be a hundred percent, and I. I the council may be a tad high um, for my taste. Also, I think the surveyors love. The, the responsibility of the surveyor's office has really grown substantially, particularly with the, the GIS portfolio. And uh, I, yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that salary is low compared to the responsibilities of the job. No, I just don't want to feather my nest. I don't want you know. I'm glad that I, you I, I okay. Well. <laughs> Whatever. You know what? You don't want this. To, no, no one wants to be on the council just to make. That's fine. I won't oh, fight. That. Out loud, I won't it? fight. I won't yeah. fight that. That's a pretty old. Right. I need to turn your mic on. So sorry. I mean, we're having a conversation. I I, I, I will not okay. fight that one. But okay, I, I would like to see the survey. Okay. Are there other comments or from this end that I keep ignoring and I apologize? I, I would like Molly to comment first regarding the surveyor. Um, I think what Kim wants me to say, <laughs> and I was going to say, is there is a statute. So 36 to 1215 makes a differentiation in between a licensed surveyor 
and a unlicensed surveyor. Yeah, it needs to so, be one and a half times. Mm -hmm, yeah. Correct. One and a half times. So, What's, yeah. What? It has to be one and no, a half? It says a the compensation fixed under one subdivision half. one and subdivision one of the statute references a, a licensed surveyor must be one and one half times that fixed under subdivision two, which is a non-registered. So registered gets one and one half times more than a non-registered or non-licensed registered. Right. So if we set the amount instead of using percentages, um, the licensed one should actually be one and a half times more than what we've got here. So, yeah. So, I mean, you can set whatever you want for the unlicensed because that's where Tron is right at the moment. And then just, multi, you know, one and a half times more will be, then be your licensed. Mm -hmm. So, and that was one of the other things that. Oh, and we needed while to we're considering it, there's a similar statute for the corner, which is why there's a licensed and unlicensed in the grid. That was my next question. Yep. It's one and one half times two. Yeah, that, you know, the, the, that statute for the, with respect, I didn't know about that about the corner, but the statute with respect to the surveyor, that has always been a reason to hold down the salary of the, of the surveyor. Um, I mean, as long as I've been on the council, it's been used as a reason because, you know, we don't want to take the chance that we get a licensed surveyor and their salary will be enormous. Um, so it's, it's kind yeah, of that's unfortunate. Interesting. Um, it, it has sort of a perverse effect, I think, but. Right. And I right. Mean, if you, if you would like to see him at a higher percentage, I mean, I can do that right now and you can see, and we can fix that so that it's. Well, if you, if, if you, I just did some quick, please check my math, but it looked like to me, if you kept the license surveyor at that hundred percent and you did that calculation for just determining our unlicensed surveyor, you'd be at 66-ish percent, right? Which puts him much lower than he is, which is ridiculous. And I'm not suggesting right. that. So my little nice system is all, as I suspected, not neat. So, and, but I just wanted you to be aware that whatever you set the unlicensed, you're going to have to go one and a half. Right above for the licensed we recognize it which at this point that's a that's purely theoretical because Correct. we don't have one and it's not like you're going to just go out and take the test it's a multi-year process Correct, but so but it's, but an, it's, it's an election away should it true correct you know yeah. so true. um and is it one and a half times for the coroner as well is that the same so it is for the coroner it's comes it's verse um it's whether it's licensed to practice as a physician in Indiana. And if so, then that under that compensation model, it would be one and one half times higher. So if they're licensed as a physician, they have to make one and one half times higher compensation than if they were not licensed as a physician. Okay. And the licensure is only for a physician. It's not for mm -hmm. any type of a nursing. If it says compensation for the coroner as if the coroner is not licensed to practice as a physician in Indiana. Physician. Yeah. Okay. Physician. And is, is there a reason why coroner licensed to sit at 90% and not 100%? But it's just in the model this way? Truly, it was, it, she, she, she's changed some things just to play around with it, but those numbers were just, I'm throwing some stuff in there, guessing. At this yeah, point, guess. I'm assuming that everything's the way it is because of some statute that I'm not aware of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a bad idea. Yeah. Um, are there other concerns or comments on these different percentages? Again, I, I said this earlier, but people were talking. Uh, my turn, to, Molly, you, you, would, you would ask the question of, should we set the base, that 100% for level three assessor or level one assessor? And it is my opinion that you should keep it the way it is and leave it as level three. And I think that's how it is in the 2022 salary ordinance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, and the rationale is that's, that provides parity with other elected officials. So you don't have the assessor making a, a lot more than the auditor, clerk, and recorder. Yes. So a lot of good information was, was relayed uh, tonight by, by Ms. Turner King and by Michelle. And 
I think it would be good to reference that in whatever chart we put together, reference the statutes, um, mm -hmm. reference the, the multipliers. And I think that'd be helpful for future council so we know yes. what we did when we moved down the road. Yes, and uh, I, I just emailed all of council those three statutes that I referenced. So thank you. It's easier to read them sometimes okay. than hear me talk about them. Right, and I already have the assessor one uh, referenced in the salary ordinance, and I just kind of stumbled across these as we were working on the questionnaires with regards to the surveyor and the okay. coroner. So those will be a, additions for the 2023. Thank you. Um, I, I just had a quick, we spent a lot of time this summer getting data, going through the every bit of data we could on these different salary components as compared to other counties. I'm very curious if anyone here can share what we found related to commissioner pay and other elected officials in across the state as we looked at it. Is there anyone that can comment to that? Yes, I suppose there are a couple of people who could comment on that. And I can certainly share what I recall and Councilor Munson can, can correct me if I get it wrong. There, we found no support in the comparison counties for the, the salaries being higher than they currently are. Um, and they're currently using this system. It looks like they're currently below 80 percent um so yeah most of most of the yeah it, and we looked at a number of different we looked at it a number of different ways we really tried to be as as fair and in some cases i think generous as we could picking the c comparison county pool based on um total levy i believe of the county and um, yes, Jeff yeah, McCann and population. population of the county as well, yes. I was just gonna ask in fairness, didn't it also find that the, um, there was no justification for raising the council salaries? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. I just wanna say, I think also in the, in the information that we gathered and everything, Monroe County is like right in the middle. Yeah. We're, we are median, you know, mm -hmm. and compared to the, the counties that we compared it to, we're right in the middle. So uh, yeah. maybe even just slightly higher on some some things, yeah. you know, so, but. Mm -hmm. I, I just. Go ahead. You know, I, I just maintain that, that, that a lot of these statewide salaries for, uh, for commissioners is just based on an, uh, kind of an earlier model of what a commissioner is. And mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't see it as a, a part, you know, a part-time thing that, you know, people have other full-time jobs do on the side. I just, I think it's too, it's too important, too big to be a side hustle. I, yeah, I, point I, taken. I certainly recognize the importance really of every position that we have up there. I think the demands on county officials are, are not decreasing. The other day I heard an argument for something, well, it's, it's not getting easier for that job. I, I think that's every job in the world from that deputy to that attorney to, these jobs up here, but I, when I, I, I'm a little bit relieved to hear that we're not some outlier that has completely kind of lost our way with this. Um, and whatever solution that we come to, like I, I, I will be, I'll be, I'll be pleased with that. Um, but I, I, th I think it, there is a recognition that we have looked into what we pay what we pay, what um, is suitable. And I also, I don't want us to lose sight of what we have done over a period of time that at least I have been on the council. I'm not saying it's all, it's me or anyone, but we have moved those salaries. In fact, we have moved commissioner's salary quite a bit. And, I, and I'm not saying that, that it was, was poorly conceived or anything like that. I'm just saying, I don't want that to get lost in the shuffle. Our predecessors did not always do that. And I'm not pointing blame at them either, but we have moved from that model. Um, so <laughs> whoever our predecessors might be. So anyway, I, I never like I never like the council to diminish what we have done. I mean, we've had a robust Fair discussion enough. tonight about lots of 
pay and, and salary for, for folks. As one of your predecessors, fair enough. <laughs> we have many different kinds of predecessors. This is the predecessor wing. You have to check out <laughs> the, the predecessor that was born here. In this. Uh, we didn't always have the kind of money because we didn't really uh, go after taxing local folks as much as some people like new taxes now. Uh, the people That's in my district would rather not be taxed so much. So uh, That's fine. But if we're going to tax people, let's keep good employees. And you cannot expect to keep good employees if they can't even afford to buy groceries. You know? Yes. Um, are there any other comments on this topic? Well, my wife is calling me for dinner. So. I understand. And I appreciate you all taking the time on this. Um, Do we have any, before we adjourn, are there any final comments from council or staff on the budgets from the past week and a half, two weeks? Just thank you for your tremendous work on, I thank everybody, but yeah. in particular, yeah. Council President Wells. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Enormous amount of time and effort on this. You're welcome. So. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank the department for, but yes, and, and, and our staff, and our staff who made this the auditor's office and our deputies who are probably want to get home to get dinner too. <laughs> and really, as a reminder, the department heads who who really had to step up and do things differently. That's this true. Year. It was a yep. whole different it's system a whole this year. Different process, yep. and I mean, I appreciated all the departments, you know, and. There were times, I mean, it, like Beth mentioned, you know, I'm holding their hands, trying to get them to get the same report that I'm looking at. So I know what they're talking about. And I think uh, this year it was, you know, everybody had growing pains, but I think next year will be even better. Yeah. Um, we just got to figure out a way to be able to display the information larger so that everybody can see it, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, I just could not manipulate it as well, you know. Okay. Of, well, and somehow or the other, even if we could just start even a, a week earlier so that we would get the numbers right earlier because to get them well we got them was really that great. that all depends on you guys too with regards right. to making a decision earlier I okay. so that i can get the information to you earlier julie so noted. i had no idea part of the delay was because we couldn't make up our mind whether or not it was five percent so she couldn't move forward yeah well so, in fairness that's something that comes from deliberation not you right. know you can't make the decision before you make the decision that's right the, right you know so it's like so, councillor iverson yeah um I, attention spans are shortening like we know that's happening and i really appreciate uh, us getting out of here at like before nine o'clock every single night i think having it spread over five nights is useful and i also think it's helpful for transparency because i think that the, the more concise we make these the more people are going to pay attention and i think that's really important our viewership rose by a hundred percent i mean well these are the metrics but I, I do think it was it was nice to be home a little earlier and it was nice to spread it out. Yes. And I did try to spread things out. So. Yes, you did. Yeah. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll adjourn the final budget session for uh, 2023. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.